Salutations, everyone. Yes, yes, no fur man things here for a guide video. And that's about the full extent of the Skaven talk I'm going to do. Hi, everybody. I'm Lord Foran. Welcome to a guide on Skaven or Total Warhammer 3. Uh, this video is going to be divided into multiple chapters, so skip to the section you'd like. We're going to cover faction concepts, how they play, followed by units, economy, technology, and then the various lords, their starting locations, starting strategies, and any unique mechanics to the lords, of which there are several. If you do enjoy this video and learn something new for it, leave a like, a comment, and maybe even subscribe, ring that bell, and uh, let me know what you think about it. Let's get right into it. So the Skaven are a rather unique faction. Uh, unlike some of the other standard fantasy ones, they're quite literally man-sized insane rats uh, with a predilection for backstabbing, lurking in the shadows, and in general causing havoc. Um, if you know the Total Warhammer, there's the four chaos gods, and then there's the horned rat who kind of, as far as I understand, aspires to be one of the four chaos gods, but it actually isn't. Um, thus, the Skaven are entirely devoted to their own god. What this means is the Skaven have a different form of corruption. So rather than your various different corruptions, they have Skaven corruption. Skaven corruption is quite important because due to the changes from Total Warhammer 2 to 3, it now provides control and food when Skaven Corruption is low, and as Skaven Corruption gets higher and higher, even as the Skaven, you will start having control um, problems in your provinces leading to unrest. Now, the Skaven can handle that unrest, but it is definitely a pain. Another thing to note, it is a change from Total Warhammer 2 to 3, is that none of your buildings actually reduce corruption anymore. In fact, everything you build provides corruption, some of which provide corruption in neighboring provinces. What this means is it gets to be rather difficult to maintain the order of your provinces, and then the idea behind the change was to inspire people to constantly need to be expanding to get more food. Now, what is food? Well, that's another Skaven mechanic. Being giant rats, the Skaven are rather obsessed with eating and breeding to an extreme degree. Um, supposedly, there are more Skaven in the world than any other race by several times factor. Thankfully, most of the Skaven live underground, but when they become above ground, they need food. So you can get food through a variety of things, battles, low corruption, some buildings after post-battle options, as well as looting, raiding, etc. And um, all told, you're going to be dealing with a lot of food problems during the game. As food gets higher, you get growth, control, and leadership in your armies or allied territories. When it gets low, look at those penalties. Control, leadership, lack of income, buildings are more expensive, and lack of growth. Basically, you never want to be low food. Ideally, the lowest you want to get is normal food levels. Or ideally, if you can pull it off. Um, pushing it beyond the initial ideal spot to surplus food supplies where you actually do get some benefits. Here, you still have a bit of a penalty. Now, why are you ever going to run out of food? Well, first off, food is used to upkeep settlements. Every settlement you have is a food. Every army you have is a food. If the enemy causes trouble for you or you expand your under empire or colonize, you can also have food problems. So let's demonstrate one of those options. So if we go here and win this battle, first off, we'll talk about another mechanic, then we'll get back to food since we're here. The Skaven have this menace below ability. Basically, by, by getting better tech or by spending food, they can increase the numbers of this ability. As you'll notice as I go up, it tells me where my food will be. What this ability does is it allows you to summon a unit of clan rats, which are not the world's greatest unit. The Skaven struggle, similar to the undead factions, to have a really strong front line early on. Uh, this allows you to summon a unit to the battle. Obviously, doing it nine times gives you nine more units. The Skaven tend to win battles through masses of troops rather than having the best troops on the battlefield, and this helps. Now, be aware that if you do this, you can quickly deplete your food supply, but it'll give you a nice little boost in some battles. You start with a default amount, and that can go up through tech and other things. 
So as you, when we won that, we got two food from the battle. Um, although it, it says captives. Now we get to some interesting options. We can raise it for food. We can sack it for the normal resources. We can expand the under empire, and we will talk about that. Or we can occupy the settlement at level one, but by paying food, 20 per settlement level, we can get it up to a level three occupation. On the other hand, it will drop us immediately into a food shortage, but it allows the Skaven to expand very quickly. So long as they have food, they can have high level settlements. Obviously, if they don't have food, it's a little bit harder for them to grow. Thankfully, the Skaven actually have a decent growth rate as long as you're positive food. So for a lot of your settlements, you're going to want to occupy at one. But once you get into your larger capital settlements, you can colonize them at an extremely high level, basically max level almost immediately, so long as you have the food. So one thing to note here as well is we have a 105 food limit. If we occupy and take settlements, now that is 110. Every settlement you get provides additional food supply capacity. Now, it doesn't supply the food, which is annoying, but it allows you to actually store more so it's a little bit harder to drop to lower levels, as in you're not stuck at 110 the whole game. Um, and that's very important. Now, this is a bit of the economy section, but let's talk slightly about... Um, Actually, I can't show you it here. I'll have to show you it later. Um, there is a building that gives you food. It's called a Warpstone Generator, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Um, the Skaven also have edicts that can provide food as well at the cost of corruption. And they also have access to rights, one of which generates food per turn. You're probably going to use this a lot more than you would expect just to help with food, but also the growth, recruitment, and control is really nice. It's a bit expensive with a 15 turn cooldown, but thankfully the Skavens don't have a real problem with money. And of course, there are three other rights because they're a total Warhammer 2 Vortex faction. They get the Scheme of Doom, which summons a Warlock Engineer, where you can either establish an Undercity, or you can cause a catastrophic earthquake there and severely damage the settlement. Uh, it appears near your faction leader, and you have the research technology first to get it. But this can be very powerful. Um, under cities are very useful. We'll talk about them in a minute. But the earthquake there can absolutely wreck a settlement for your future invasion. The next one here is the Pestilence Scheme. And these vary slightly depending on the faction. Um, this one allows you to summon a Plague Priest, which will spread a plague. This is not the same plague as the Nurgle Plagues. In fact, it can affect the Nurgle factions, as well as the Nur Nurgle Plagues affecting you. I really wish they had a slightly different icon for the plagues. It's a bit confusing. This can be extraordinarily powerful. You drop this on an enemy settlement with an army there, and they're going to suffer some nasty attrition, making it much easier for you to invade. Now, you do have to build the Pestilent Nave for that. And in order to do this dominating skin, you have to do the expansionist uh, planning commandment, which is the food. I believe it gives you three food and two Skaven corruption. And then we have... The Skaven's obsession with 13 reappearing. For some reason, the Skaven love the number 13, uh, as well as bells. I don't entirely understand it, but it's kind of cool. Uh, better relations with Skaven, yeah. Loyalty gain, yes, the Skaven have to deal with the annoying loyalty mechanic that if a lord's loyalty falls too low, they will defect, take their army, and try and start their own faction. The reality is, keep them happy, keep them fed with a large army, and they're not going to revolt. The next one, hero success, enemy hero success chance down, and clan Moore's clan stone. Now this varies based off what Skaven faction you are. Right now we're on Queek's clan Moors. So this is a boost to armor piercing weapon damage, and that's really easy to hit. Get like seven on Queek. Okay, let's talk about under cities. So under cities, and Queek starts with one, actually in Tarak Eight Peaks is a hidden settlement. So this settlement is owned by the Crooked Moon Mutinous Gits. But there is a little icon here that we've established an Undercity. Now, when we took the settlement, you saw there was an option to build an Undercity. Honestly, if you're taking a settlement to establish an Undercity, uh, unless you're taking minor settlements, it's really not worth using that as an occupation option. Um, but it can be pretty powerful. Usually the effort of conquering it can be a pain. 
On the other hand, the Skaven can also um, do it with heroes, as we saw with the Warp Block Engineer. And they can actually use Skaven Undercities to spread Skaven Undercities. So let's look at some of the buildings. The first one here is basically a annexation building. This one, which starts fully built, increases movement, replenishment rate, corruption, and gives you a huge bonus ship to leader ship and access to a lot more menace below. Uh, what this does mean is Queek is actually the best positioned out of the three people going for Kara Gate Peaks to get it early on. Um, also in that tree is this underpass. This is similar to the other one. Um, it allows lightning strike, more movement, income from sacking and raiding in the area, and vanguard deployment. This one can be quite useful if you throw down in a settlement that you don't want um, to own any in the region, but you just want to keep raiding over and over for food and money. This is a pretty powerful thing to throw in there. If you're going to sack a settlement to set up an undercity, this is probably one of the things you're going to want to build there anyhow. Uh, be aware that they say discoverability at the base of these. Uh, what that is, is a meter over here. When this builds all the way up to full, the enemy will detect it, and then they can spend money to destroy it. Now, if there's heroes nearby, they can also help the detection. In my experience, so long as you stay around 60 or 70 detection, you're probably fine. Um, unless you're going to immediately attack the next turn, don't uh, hit 100 at any point, or even 80, because a single hero will then detect it. Now, there are some ways to control that, but let's first do this one. This is the Ruination tab. Once you build this, the discoverability hits 140, meaning the enemy will discover your settlement and by and large destroy it. Now, obviously, that's bad. And then the top one here, if you complete it, which, by the way, one turn to build this, five turns to build this. So you're giving the AI five turns to react or another player, uh, unless you lower discoverability, where they summon a Skaven army buffed by uh, technology, and you declare war on it, and the Undercity is destroyed. This combines nicely with some of these other abilities um, to give you a huge chance of uh, trying to take a settlement. Be aware that it's probably not going to be able to take a settlement with an army in it, but if it's an empty settlement, yes, it will be enough to take a settlement. Just be aware of the discoverability problem. So how do we prevent the discoverability from hitting 100% and getting destroyed? That is your concealment building. So this first one here, Lowers discoverability by 20, costs money to do. The next one lowers it by 40. Even if you were to build this with the ruination one, you would be caught because it would still be 100. However, there is deeper tunnels, which lowers discoverability by 40. So if for some reason you want to use the ruination one, the vermin tide, uh, you're going to probably have to build both deeper tunnels and kill perches to lower it by 80. So then it only hits 60 and you've got an actual chance of pulling it off. Unfortunately, these do cost money. This one ruins the visibility, which with an undercity, you get to see the area. So you can establish quite the network of views around the map. The next one here is your food building. So say you're struggling with food income and you want to balance it out, you can use undercities. In fact, I recommend you do. So the first one here, food generation. On the other hand, it costs discoverability. You can usually th safely throw this or even this higher one down in almost any settlement, but then you're not going to be able to build really any other buildings without throwing down a concealment building. The next one is a raiding camp. This is a discoverability of 80, meaning you almost definitely need a concealment building, but it gives you money and it siphons off 10% of the local settlement's income. You throw this down in somewhere like Marienburg, uh, Lotharin, um, any of the major capitals in the game, and you can make some nice amount of money from them. On the other hand, Skaven aren't desperate for money like some other factions. The food is lower than this one, which is easier and cheaper to build. All told, I prefer the scavenger horde. The next one is if you want to make money. True, you can use this, but there's better ways. This first one just generates a lump sum of cash. The downside is it costs food to build. Obviously, these all spread corruption, but I'm just ignoring that. The next one here siphons off a percent of the settlement's income. Be aware that this is two food. It's a discoverability of 80, so you're going to need a concealment. So it's actually going to lower the income you get. 
But if you stick this on a major settlement or a gold mine one, Castle Drakenhof springs to mind. Um, you can actually get some serious money from it. The food cost is a pain, though. And then the next one is your mining. So the Skaven are all about warp stone, which is kind of like a weird radioactive uranium thing that grants weird superpowers, insanity, and causes immense amount of havoc. The Skaven are obsessed with it. So the first thing you can do is a subterranean pit, which costs food and gold, but there is a chance every turn that your under empire will be expanded and it can get up to 10%. So it could theoretically, you could build one under city, set up a mining operation, spread it to multiple ones, and then build buildings in those to actually get a benefit. Of course, you can destroy these buildings later. Um, so this is usually a good one to build early on if you've got the food to spare. It's better to have more under uh, empire settlements than not. The next one here is a warp stone refinery. Increased winds of magic, research rate, and reduced upkeep for warp fire stuff, and as well as a recruitment rank. The cost in the food is a little bit painful, but if you've got excess food and money, great building to throw down. Specifically, the re recruit rank, you throw down nine of these, you're going to have max level of some of the Skaven's strongest units. And then up here, we have the subterranean strip mine. This is a very interesting one. First off, it gives access to a bomb ability to use for the armies in the region, which is a decent ability. Uh, you basically blow up one of your units uh, to damage the enemy around them. Um, thankfully, the Skaven have plenty of weak units. It also gives money, decreased construction costs, which is nice, trade tariffs. The big benefit is income from raising settlements um, go up. So if you get this in a major settlement, build this, and if you raise the settlement, you can make some serious cash. 300% is absolutely nuts. And that is the Undercity. In my experience, you're going to be using it a lot to spread food or to help with offense or defense. You're probably going to have to get used to spending money maintaining them. Uh, it doesn't all balance out. Like You cannot make a Skaven Undercity actually give you stuff unless you put it in a major settlement. Like this Thieves' Hidey Hole can actually do it. Combined with a scavenger raider and potentially a murder hole, you can make money and food, but it takes a while to get to that point, and it only works in certain settlements. Plus, it's not the easiest to spread it anyway. Now, you can't spread it into an area where another Skaven has an undercity, uh, nor can you stick it in other Skaven settlements, which does limit your options. Now, another thing I forgot to mention here, though, is with the Skaven corruption, first off, you've got a map mode here, which is a little disorienting to look at. Tells you basically the spread of your corruption. It also, the more the corruption is in a province, the more menace below of your army ability you get access to. Meaning, the more corrupted a province is, the easier it is for the Skaven defend, but the less beneficial and stable the province is. Uh, I don't entirely agree with the change from Total Warhammer 2. I think they should have had a corruption reduction building, even at a huge cost, just so you could keep a single province stable. Okay. Let's talk about units. So the Skaven have quite the roster. Um, be aware some of these are regiments of renown. And we will try and cover all of these that we can. Some of these are extended, so we'll talk about them on the factions that use those. So the first thing to note, obviously, where this is not a capital settlement, so disregard the X's. So the first thing you get access to are what are called the Skaven Slaves. These are arguably the second or third weakest units in the game, right up there with the zombies. Um, they're pure trash. They are also dirt cheap to build and maintain. Um, you can deploy them anywhere. They will not win in a fight versus anything, but they will tie down the enemy, but they're not even that good at defense. So most good units, Cav in particular, will literally just go right through them. Don't deploy them against elite infantry unless they're a distraction. They make a great unit, though, to blow up using that warp bomb ability to actually hurt the enemy. The next we have is the Skaven Slave Spears. This is a slightly better unit, slightly being the operative word here. They're still really bad. Um, these are better at melee defense, so by and large, you're going to want to use these over the actual Skaven Slaves because the difference in combat strength is not so substantial that the Skaven Slaves are actually going to kill anything. Honestly, they will die. They will get like two kills versus anything at most. Uh, it's pretty pathetic. 
Now, on the other hand, they also, both of these units, in fact, all the Skaven Slaved units have expendable, meaning that if they die, better units like your elite infantry do not suffer leadership. Now, on the other hand, it does affect other expendable units. So what can happen is when one Skaven Slave routes, all the other ones around it start routing as well. Uh, it's a little bit of a downside, but at least your elite units will stay on the battlefield, right? The next thing, you have Strength in Numbers. This is a passive ability on a lot of the Skaven units. Basically, it gives defense and leadership while you have more than 50% hit points, meaning their melee defense and their leadership is not as bad as it might appear, even though 35 is absolutely terrible leadership. And the next one is Scurry Away. When your leadership is wavering or lower, as in usually they're running away, routing, but not shattered, um, they move faster. This is actually quite nice for the Skaven. It's quite common to have Skaven units run away, then re-muster, and then come back to the battlefield. Obviously, Skaven slaves are the worst for it, but it does lead to a very annoying thing while fighting the Skaven, where you'll break the Skaven's lines. Their units will flee away from you faster than you can catch. They'll regroup and come back. Now, unlike other factions like the Undead, the Skaven units outside of the Skaven Slaves have actually decent combat stats. Their problem is usually the leadership. And the last Skaven Slave unit, and probably one you might use more than the others because it actually can do something, is the Skaven Slave Slingers. This is a default range unit. It's got a medium range, has a minor missile strength damage and decent ammunition. Early on, if you've got nothing else to throw in your army and you don't need more infantry, throw a couple dozen of these into your armies. Um, they won't get many kills. They'll get like 10, maybe 15, but they're going to get more kills than your Skaven Slave units, in my experience. Uh, and they do a pretty good job at tying up enemy units just because they're a ranged unit and they can run away so they can skirmish. Of course, you have better ones. Ignore this one because this is unique to Clan Moors, but it gives food, growth, income, but you're not going to have it for most people. The next one here is your Clan Pit. This is where you actually start getting better warriors than your Skaven Slaves. The first one is Clan Rats, which we've seen. They're not that great in combat. Um, better at melee attack and defense than the Skaven Slaves. Similar strength and numbers and scurry away. There is a tech that you can get later on that makes them expendable, at which point. Uh, they are even cheaper to build and maintain, and they pretty much should be used to replace Skaven Slaves. The other one here is Clan Rats with Spears. Again, once you get it upgraded to become expendable, you should never use Skaven Slaves again. These are immensely superior. A single Skaven Slave unit will decimate... Um, sorry, a single Clan Rat unit will decimate Skaven Slaves. Uh, and this one here, with the Charge Reflection, is much better to use than the one with just a sword, although it will get less kills. The next one you get is a Chieftain. This is your melee specialist unit for the Skaven. Be aware it does have low leadership, but it does provide Guardian to Lords and Heroes nearby, making it very useful to throw on the battlefield. Uh, it also has Power Grab, which provides leadership to your entire army. It's always worth having one of these in your army if you can afford it. Um, all told, its melee combat stats are lower than basically any other melee Lord in the game, outside of maybe the Tomb Kings. Um, but it can get upgraded to the point it can do some substantial damage. Um, they're reasonably well armored, which is quite interesting, meaning uh, they actually do pretty well against basic troops. Um, lords and heroes, they struggle with a bit, but the Skaven have other ways of killing lords and heroes. The next one we have is the upgraded version of the clan rats, both with shields and with um, uh, spears and shields. I recommend 99% of the time you take the clan rat spears with shields. Uh, the protection from range on a spear unit is much better than obviously the low level ones, but the increased melee defense over the actual ability to fight with swords um, makes the Skaven slay clan rat spears way more useful than the clan rats with swords and shields. Um, basically, this is going to be the bulk of your army if you've got if you can't afford or you don't have access to better units. They're not going to kill anything. They won't really win battles for you, but their job is to be uh, basically a meat shield tank line that holds. And they do a decent job at holding, actually. Uh, and the spears allow them to handle cav much better. And then finally at the top, we get access to an actually good 
Uh, combat unit. These are the storm vermins. These things are actually legitimately terrifying on the battlefield with the Skaven. They're a tier 3 infantry unit. So yes, this is a jump from a tier 1 unit to tier 3 with a single upgrade. They're heavily armored. They've got a sword and shield, and then they have one with halibards. It's really up to you which one you use. The halibard is better at armor. So if you're going to fight the dwarves or another heavily armored faction, you're going to want the halibards. Otherwise, the sword and shield storm vermin is going to be the bread and butter of your armies against everyone else. The big reason you might actually take the one with sword and shield over the one with the halibard is that it has a shield to block range attacks. The weakness of the halibards is they can get bombarded from a distance, but they handle cav and armor better than the storm vermins with sword and shield. Now, they are not an expendable unit, just like the clan rats. They never become an expendable unit. These are going to be pretty much your elite infantry during the game. Uh, they do their job. They're not as great as some of the other elite infantry, but they're cheaper to build, and you get them at level 3 rather than higher. The next one is the Clan Eshin uh, Assassin's Tree, and this is more relevant if you play as the Clan Eshin Skaven faction, and we'll talk more about what that faction is when I get to that section for the Starting Lords. But suffice to say, this is your range um, tree, basically, your ranged infantry tree. So the first one you get is the Assassin. This is how you're going to kill enemy lords rather than the Chieftain, which is more um, buffing your troops and fighting mass units. The assassin is all about killing enemy lords and heroes. They have this hex as well as slippery. They can massively weaken an enemy. 24 is huge. Uh, it can even make some of the most powerful lords in the game actually be vulnerable. And it lasts for 30 seconds, which is pretty huge. Uh, it also can stalk and be unspottable if outside of melee, meaning it can quickly isolate and kill weakened lords you bring two of these to an army they're going to be able to assassinate working together almost any lord in the game played properly they also have some nice physical resistance meaning they're surprisingly tanky don't really use them against um, mass units though they kind of fall apart there low melee defense high melee attack they're all about jumping the enemy doing lots of damage and then running away um, they're a duelist as it says that's how you should use them once you get them, having at least one, if you can, two in an army will allow you to deal with lords and heroes effectively. Prior to that, you have to use your legendary lords or hope that your much weaker chieftains can kill things. Okay, the next ones we have access to are the Night Runners. And there is an actually difference between these two. So these are kind of a skirmishing unit. Uh, think horse archers without the horses. They move faster than most infantry. They're not going to be able to outrun cavalry. They do surprisingly good missile damage. If you look at their missile damage here, they've got 17 missile damage, which is really nice. Plus, they're physically resistant, and they're decent in actually fighting. Um, leadership, of course, is still a problem. Now, these guys can fire while moving, meaning they can just run away and skirmish like nobody's business. They also um, have hide in porous and vanguard deployment. Meaning you can hide them around the map in a battle and they can come and get some rather devastating flanks. The other one here, though, is the Night Runners with Slings. So the big difference here is this one can fire while moving, this one can't. On the other hand, this has a range of 70, this has a range of 140. Um, all told, the Night Runners with Slings are way better range units. The downside of not being able to fire while being chased though, is considerable. I tend to actually use the, the Night Runners without slings more often than I do with the slings. Obviously, it's your personal preference or depending on the enemy you're fighting, like running away if you're fighting a cav faction like Bretonia isn't going to help you because they're going to catch you anyway. All told, they're, they're much better than your Skaven Slave Slingers, and once you get them Trying to build Skaven and Slave Slingers really is not what you should be doing. The next level, uh, we get more uh, Assassin's Hideouts. We get Gutter Runners with Poison. So this is pretty much an upgrade, um, upgraded version of the lower ones. They can fire while moving. They move hidden in any terrain. They can throw a net to weaken and slow enemies so then they can shoot them. They have physical resistance and they have poison. 
all told, this next level is much better than your Night Stalkers lower level down, or Night Runners down there. Um, this one has poison. This one is a Slinger with poison. And these are the defaults without poison. All told, the ones with poison are usually worth bringing over the ones without poison. They are more expensive, but the Skaven don't hurt that much with money. Poison, of course, weakens the enemy. Now, obviously, the Gunner Runners fire while moving and stock. The ones with the Slingers do not fire while moving. So just be aware that continues. If they're Slingers, they can't run away and shoot. They have to run away, stop, and then shoot. Whereas the other ones can run and shoot at the same time. And yes, running away is a pretty common tactic for Skaven armies. And then finally at the top, we get into the elite assassin units, along with some units that I'm not the biggest fans of. But the first one is an Eshin Sorcerer. Uh, it's a spellcaster with access to the variety of Skaven spells of stealth. Some of them are really good. The ability to put stock, missile damage, armor, missile resistance are all really good. Not heavily on damage. Yes, they have a Vortex spell but they're mainly used to debuff the enemy and hide and maneuver your units. Their toxic rain is quite interesting. Uh, it drastically can weaken an enemy army if used properly. Um, as you can see, it's a lot of negative effects. Uh, basically, if you're struggling with fighting enemies because they're stronger, bring one of these guys and keep casting spells. The toxic rain will definitely weaken them. And now there are actually other units. So both of these are type assassin units. They are, they are rather disappointing, I would say, for their level. They're outclassed by storm vermin. Um, death runners, dual swords, basically they stalk, they flank, they do damage. They have this concealment bomb to um, get stock and unspottable. They do decent combat strength. Honestly, though, I don't feel that they're a level four building unit. They do weaken the enemy armor, which is really handy for actually killing armored units because they're also armor piercing. Great against heavily armored targets, but the reality is their combat stats are low, so expect for them to die uh, fighting anything of a decent strength. But against mid-tier units, they will absolutely wreck them. And the next one here is Guan Dao Infantry, uh, which is similar to uh, Spears. Not exactly. These are your anti-cav assassin units, similar, they're really good against armor. They have physical resistance, but the reality is they're not going to hold up against that much in combat. They don't even have a huge boost to melee defense that most whole arm type weapons do. Um, but they are quite good at killing armored cav unit. But I find they still die rather quick, and the storm vermins with halibards are, in my opinion, still better. All told, this is a powerful assassination line. This is more your main infantry line. Now, the Skaven are also known as crazy engineers as well as insane bio tinkers. So the first one here is a weapons dump. Gives you access to warp grinders, which is a unit that on paper looks particularly bad. And it is, but you can get them upgraded to the point they actually become useful. The first thing they can do is it can affect enemies that are grounded, lock them in place, which can be handy for a Skaven army. They also have a Warp Quake, which does damage in an area. And yes, it can be some decent uh, combo of damage if you use them together. Um, it's all the pretty standard stuff. They can't smash their way through walls, which is quite cool. They are armor piercing with a magical attack. But if you look at their combat stats, they're terrible. There's a tech or two that buffs them at which point they become useful. Don't expect these to hold or win any melee fights early on, though. Just don't. They're very selective usage, and they really require a tech to be good. The next one, Warp Fire Throwers. This is getting into the craziness that is Warp Fire. Um, warp Fire is particularly nasty. Uh, it lowers leadership. It's kind of like Napalm or Greek Fire. Um, it has a low level range, but it does a lot of missile strength. Left alone, this can absolutely wreck uh, units like dwarves and stuff. Um, the downside is once you deploy this to the map, they're an obvious target to kill. In melee combat, they don't survive. But if you can keep them out of getting attacked, as in get a nice flank, 
or have units tie up the enemy. They can absolutely wreck units despite being only a tier one uh, weapons team. Moving on up, this is tier two. These are one of the funnest things in the game to use. These are rattling guns, which is obviously a play on the word gatling gun. Um, they are a machine gun, <laughs> the crank driven machine gun. They're a tier three unit and they deserve it. They've got a reasonably long range. They suppress enemies to slow them and their armor piercing. They are really good. The downside is they're not the world's most accurate shooters, um, but left alone, just like the warp fire throwers, as long as they don't get attacked, they can absolutely wreck the enemy. In fact, you can do a tire firing line to shoot at the enemy as they approach and then retreat. The downside is honestly having to micro command them on a battlefield to get flanks and firing lines since they are a straight shoot gun unit. They don't do arcs, meaning you either have to be really high above the enemy or you have to have a straight line of fire with none of your units in the way. Um, there's nothing more infuriating than having a team of ratlings that won't shoot because there's a single or two units in the way blocking their firing path. Although honestly, with the Skavens, in lore, they'd probably just shoot their own unit. Um, the next one here is Poison Wind Globadiers. This is a nasty unit. Um, it gets There's an upgrade to this where it gets even more crazy. This is basically a poison grenade unit. Um, they throw them. They release a cloud of warpstone gas. They stay there. They do decent damage for a while. They do damage over time, which is why this missile strength is so low. And yes, that damage over time can be quite nasty. If the enemies stay there, low level range, good ammunition, but they do do an arc throw, so you can deploy them from behind your lines as well. Hilariously, they're armored, even though they can't stand up in melee combat to anything, but archers have a little bit of trouble with them because these guys can get in range, throw the globe globes, and then retreat. Uh, they're quite fun to use. A group of these will absolutely ruin yours or the enemy's day. The next one, we get... Poison Win Mortars. So this is an artillery unit with Poison Globadiers, um, globes to be thrown. It's a decent range. It's not going to kill other artillery units, but infantry units, it does very good damage too. Um, it is a buff in terms of its actual damage, armor piercing, um, less armor, will not stand up into melee combat, but it's pretty cool to bring to the battlefield. It's basically just a, a mini artillery unit. The next one, Warp Lock Gizals. Um, These are very fun. They have a huge range. They are shield breaker. They're armor piercing, meaning they tend to hit one or two enemies, and they've got shields. This is your anti-ranged unit. This will wreck pretty much any archer unit in the game. Their weakness is artillery. They outrange all the archers, um, and the fact that they are shielded means the archers have trouble killing them. Their biggest weakness outside of artillery is a spell being dropped on them or getting hit by cav. Decent armor will not stand up in melee combat at all, but they shouldn't need to with that range. Park two or three of them on a hill a mile away from the enemy and just blast them. It's really fun. And then the next one is a death globe bombardier. This is similar to the poison ones, but these are more powerful ones. Um, they last longer. They do more damage. They don't do damage over time, but they don't really need to with that missile strength and poison damage. It's pretty substantial. They explode upon contact, do magic damage, all told, and a pretty well straight upgrade to the poison globadiers. These, this is how you're going to kill a lot of things as a Skaven, this tree right here. This is probably one of the strongest building tree lines in the game if used properly. Next one, we have a Warp Lock Engineer. So these are the ones that establish um, some Skaven Undercities through the rites. They have access to the whole Skaven spells. Warp Lightning in particular, as well as Doom Rocket, can be pretty powerful spells. All told, this is a bit of your damaging Skaven one with the, a debuff on the enemy leadership and attack. So as much as the... Eshin Sorcerer was buffed tier unit. This is pretty much let's kill the enemy stuff. Also, it's to note that this building does unlock technology as well as the finishing in the previous two trees, but uh, it also provides uh, the hero unit. The other one that you got from this is your Plague Claw Catapult. This is your standard catapult. It's got a long range, does good damage, 
It does have a contaminated effect that weakens leadership on the enemies it hits, meaning it's actually really good at causing routes, surprisingly. Um, it's a catapult. Bring one or two to a battlefield. Unless you have something better to use, you won't be too disappointed. It'll get some kills. The next one, now we get into some of the crazy stuff. We have warp lightning cannons. So as much as this, the one before was a catapult, this is pretty much a cannon. <laughs> so it fires in a low arc, but basically straight, huge range, good damage. It's actually really good against killing large units, mainly like monstrous units. Basically anything shot by this a couple times is gonna regret it's ever been born. Um, it's very powerful, used properly. The Skaven have an absolute monstrous siege and artillery bonuses. Uh, this is a very good unit. Be aware that it has trouble shooting enemies uphill from itself. though, And it does not last at all in combat and has pretty poor armor. But with that range of 340, you should have no trouble defending it. The next one is the Skaven's answer to Cav, the Doom Flayers. This is a war machine. It's basically giant a giant mouse wheel of death. Yes, this is a joke on those uh, mouse wheels in cages. Um, it's a pretty decent war machine. You throw it into the enemies, it's gonna deal with a lot of infantry, seeing as it's armor piercing with a bonus versus infantry. It's good against basically any type of unit other than cav. Uh, it doesn't last the longest in melee combat, although it does get a huge boost to armor. Um, they're hard to kill, they're not the best at getting kills. I still recommend treating them like normal cav, charge in, do damage, pull out, charge in again. Really up to you. They're decent at killing off archers and artillery because of their speed. Um, I wouldn't throw them against cav though. They struggle heavily. And now at the top, we have access to the doom wheel. So as much as you thought the doom flares was a pretty insane thing, the doom wheel is even nuttier. Uh, it has... Zap, meaning it fires warp lightnings. Uh, it's got a minuscule range, good weapons damage, has a lot of ammunition, and is good at fighting um, infantry as well. Basically, throw this into the enemies. Uh, it will both shoot things and run them over as a wheel. They're heavily tanky. They don't get that big buff to armor that the one below them do, but they have a base armor that's higher. Great unit. Fun to use. One entity, though, but that warp lightning is just hilarious. You've got a basically insane lightning-throwing doom wheel. Over here, now we have access to the plagues, and we have a plague priest, which is a spellcaster as well. These are the Skaven spells of plague. They're pretty much all damage or debuff spells. They do have the ability to summon units through the Vermintide ability. Combined with the menace below, you can summon like 20 units or more to the battlefield. It's pretty nuts. Um, all told, if they cast a spell, they weaken the enemy's vigor per second, meaning early on it can be worth spamming several spells to weaken the enemy before the battle starts in earnest. This is not a unit that you want to throw into melee combat, but if they do get into it, they actually do a decent job. Uh, leadership combined with frenzy, meaning they actually are pretty good in combat. I still wouldn't use them in combat unless you have no choice, but if you do, they weaken enemy leadership and have magical attacks, which is quite fun, as well as being armor piercing. Surprisingly, the Skaven have a lot of armor piercing abilities, mainly because I think they were designed to fight the dwarves as their main target. Further on up, this is a control building as well, as well as a massive spreader of Skaven corruption. I wouldn't build this for the control, because the Skaven corruption and the spread to adjacent provinces uh, is not equaled out by the control bonus. It also unlocks attack, and it's a pretty useful one. We'll talk more about that later. Up top here, we have the Plague Monks Sensor Bearers. This is an insane um, infantry unit. They basically charge at the enemy, do a lot of damage. They're reasonably resistant. They're armor piercing. They contaminate the enemy and do magic attacks. They're pretty good at flanking. They will not hold the front line, though. Um, Honestly, when I use them, I tend to be a little bit disappointed by them. Uh, I haven't fully played them as much on Total Warhammer 3 as I did 2. Um, but when I did in Total Warhammer 3, I was a bit disappointed by them. They didn't feel like a Tier 3 infantry unit. Now, they can be buffed to be better, um, and then they are actually useful, but their base level, not so much. Not for a level 5 building. 
Now over here, we get into the bio, bio tinkering, bioengineering stuff. So you have access to wolf rats, pretty similar to hellhounds of the chaos factions. Uh, it's worth noting that one of them gets poisoned, the other does not. They're also a molder monster, um, meaning that if you play clan molder, they'll get even stronger. Uh, they're fast. They can run off archers, but they're going to die against everything else. Not necessarily the most auspicious start to a building tree, but that's quickly evened out by some of the later stuff. So you get a Pathfaster, which is a support specialist. What it does is it basically can buff allies in a range, giving them stronger, as well as other various bonuses. Running with the pack is quite interesting. If you're using Clan Mulder monster units, this pack master will actually heal them while fighting. So it's kind of like a regeneration providing unit. Um, it's got decent combat stats. The big thing to focus on is melee defense so that it stays in combat longer and healing more Mulder units. It was a unique DLC thing for Total Warhammer 2. I believe you had to sign up with creative assemblies type thing to see it. But here it is again. Um, it's anti-cav, interestingly enough. Um, not that it's going to be able to kill cav. Now the next one here is we have the rat ogres. This is similar to almost like a troll unit of some of the other factions, but it moves faster, hits harder, uh, causes fear, goes into frenzies, can run away with a boat bonus if its leadership gets low, and it can get healed by pack masters. Um, its stats don't look particularly good. It's not a full reflection of how good it is. It can get buffed even higher. Um, it will actually kill things in melee, unlike your some of your weaker stuff. Outside of Storm Vermin's, most of your other infantry doesn't get a lot of kills. That's what this is here for. Further on, moving up, we have access to the Brood Horrors and the rat and Mutant Rat Ogres. So this is a huge buff up from Rat Ogres. You'll notice a massive increase in combat stats. Um, single Entity, though, verse 16. Just be aware of that. This will absolutely ruin whatever it charges day. Outside of a Lord or a Hero, there's not a lot of enemy units that are going to stand up to this um, outside of other monsters. It absolutely wrecks infantry. It's armor piercing, so it's good against any type of enemy. Um, and it does magic attacks as well. It's a great unit. Bring one or two to your army, throw them into the enemy lines, and they will kill things. Plus, they can get healed as well by Packmaster. Further on, we've got the Brood Horror. This is a poison unit with regeneration at the beginning. Um, I believe it stacks with the Packmaster's healing as well, making this thing very fast. It has a very high speed. It can keep up with Cav, hits hard, is armor piercing, causing terror. All told, it's really strong. I personally like the Mutant Rat Ogre, but this is how you're going to hunt down Cav and uh, artillery and archers with ease. Outside of your Doom Wheels, it's going to be one of your faster units. And then at the top, you have access to the Hell Pit Abomination. This is an absolutely disgusting thing to look at on the battlefield. It has the ability to, when it dies, it summons a Skaven Slave unit to fight there. Um, it's too horrible to die, though. It's constantly regening if it gets to a low health. The downside is when it casts, it is a 50-50 chance of healing massively or um, instantly dying. It's a bit of a coin flip. If it does heal, 20% hit points is really nice. Uh, it's going to kill a lot of things in its path. Just throw it into it. It's pretty good against Cav or other monstrous units. Its stats do not reflect how good it is against other monsters. And that is it for the Skaven units. All told, you don't have a very good start with Skaven. Your Skaven slaves and clan rats are rather pathetic. But once you get to level 3 settlements or even level 4 or 5, the true might of the Skaven comes into it, and late game, the Skaven can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with pretty much any army in the world and either win or draw. Their ability of using artillery weird constructs as well as their gunnery units is pretty nuts. They're right up there with the Vampire Coast as a range faction. Um, but it is worth noting that their Skaven storm vermin do their job of holding the front line, which is quite nice to see. Okay, on to the technology. So the Skaven tree is a locked tree, meaning you have to build certain buildings to unlock them. All told, if we look at the building browser, you'll see it's usually 
Um, there's two at tier three, as well as your default starting infrastructure buildings. To get to your high level stuff though, you need a capital settlement to get to four and five. And basically you have to build one of every building outside of your base barracks of your uh, army and infrastructure to get access to their full tree. So the odds of you getting access to them at the beginning is you're either going to build a rubbish pit, a, rat, a rattling warren, or a taskmaster's platform, which will give you access to the basic clan units, devious, ruthless, and ferocious. Out of them, ruthless plans is the big prize because it gives you a food generation, which is really nice. So all told, their tree is kind of divided into three different tech trees. The bottom one here is about um, your clan Eshin infantry units with range, your gutter runners, your assassins, basically all your cheap um, range units as well as your heroes. It can be pretty powerful. It can give you a huge boost to your heroes and as well as ambushes. You can kind of run around attacking everybody left and right. Um, the ambush success chance is pretty powerful because I realized I didn't talk about it. But when the Skaven are on the map, they have a chance of stalking their default attack stance, they have a chance of ambushing. Now, it does lower, lower their ambush chance, and they can go into a normal ambush, but any bonuses to ambush on the Skaven are really good. So eyes, eyes everywhere, um, it can be quite useful. Up here, Ruthless Plants, this is a little bit more about your general faction functioning. It's kind of infrastructure focused, growth, cheaper recruitments, food, leadership, Loyaltyness, plus one control in all your provinces is actually really good for the Skaven because of the changes to Skaven corruption. Carve under tunnels for the movement range, and then you start to get into some of the later combos with your stronger units. Up top, this is your infantry tree without range. Recruitment, bonus recruitment rank to clan rats. Huge casualty growth. I tend to go for this if I don't go for ruthless plans first. Five casualty replenishment rate is great. Numbers beyond counting. This is a buff for your Skaven slaves, but more importantly, it's an upkeep reduction. It almost makes them free to build and use. Uh, and the boost to melee defense makes them that much harder to kill and does a better job of making them meat shields. Stick it on your Skaven slaves with spears and they will do better. Don't worry about the charge bonus. You're still not going to be able to kill anything. The next one up here, strengths in numbers is a required one to get to the later stuff. What it does is it boosts your clan rat's combat ability at the cost of making them expendable. This is a tech you don't want to get super early. It's one of the few techs in the games I advise patience on. Uh, you want to activate this once you have access to storm vermin more than anything else. The, expand the expendable, yes, it's nice, but the downside is since early on, Clan rats are going to make up a good portion of your infantry line. Having them route then on Skaven slaves or other clan rats um, can cause some serious trouble to your lines if you're not aware of it. Um, because the expendable on applies to Skaven slaves as well, and expendable units get afraid when other expendable units route rather than normal units. Scavenging ruins, though, is a nice little armor buff for your clan rats, makes them tankier as well as Kadri of Hinchrats boosts your clan rights leadership, as well as making your chieftains recruit at a higher rank. This is quite nice since chieftains also provide a leadership boost. Take everything, sacking magic drop, it's nice. Now let's get into some of the more advanced stuff. And there are some minor changes to this tech tree based off what Skaven faction you play. So the menace below, leadership while sieging and encircling, as well as missile resistance. This is a nice buff to taking settlements that the Skaven desperately need. Um, it makes a big difference if you're actually fighting the battles. Monster plans, you get an additional clan rat from the Vermintide Undercity building, as well as a food generation and a food capacity. I like getting this. Be aware it does require a level 3 Pits of the Packmaster, which you're going to want to get anyway. Practice Goaders, this is a boost to Packmasters. Remember, you're only really going to use Packmasters if you're using uh, abominations and monsters, which if you have taken monstrous plans, you're already using. This is a buff to rat ogres. This is a buff to hell pit abominations. And this is a buff to 
their recruitment rank, as well as getting a Hell Pit Abomination in the Vermintide Undercity building, which, considering how strong a Hell Pit Abomination is, is a huge combat boost to that build, to that building, which basically, if you forgot, spawns an army to take a settlement at the cost of your Undercity. Now, Volatile Plans, Army Capacity Food as well, as well as another Clan Rat in the Vermintide. Enormous Catches is nice because it gives a Plague Catapult as well as a upkeep and ammunition for your range, your very powerful range semi-artillery invention units. Further on, Product Quality, more range, Missile Strength on all of those, which is good, as well as a Recruitment Rank. All told, this right here is a huge buff to your weird artillery and warpstone stuff. This one, more food, more clan rats, promoted on merit, more ammunition for some of your elite uh, um, machinery units, as well as lord and recruitment rank for warp lock engineers. Finally, protection gear gives armor to your units. It also has a nice little five armor boost to your storm vermin, making them that much tankier, which is nice. And they can't blame their tools, huge armor, weapon strength, and missile boost for your elite um, mechanical units. Further down here, combination, we start getting to buff for Plague Monks, as well as Leadership and Attack, as well as getting an additional Plague Monk unit in the Vermintide Undercity building. Record Effective Recipes is a boost to Plague Priests. Oppressive Plans, another Clan Rat from the Vermintide building, Food and Food Capacity. You'll notice there's a lot of bonuses towards that Vermintide Underbuilding. It's how you break super powerful settlements, including like forts or stuff. Eliminate the competition, better assassination on all your heroes, ensure absolute loyalty, a control, and a very large buff for your Storm Vermin unit, which is quite nice. Rule through fear, buff to your Death Runner units, makes them a little bit better. And this, another Doom Wheel, as well as a recruitment rank to Death Runners and Storm Vermin. All told, if you snag all the Storm Vermin stuff, they definitely serve as a Tier 3 unit. Masters of Infiltration, diplomatic relation to all faction. It's not going to help them. By the time you get this far down, everybody hates you anyway, usually. Um, I would honestly av avoid taking this tactic except till the late, late game. Plans within plans within plans within plans. It's a bit of a circular logic of the Skaven. Clan rat, food, food generation. All told, you'll get about five or six food from all your various techs, which helps your problem uh, of food upkeep doesn't solve it, but it basically allows you to upkeep six more settlements or armies. Warpstone uses huge casualty replenishment as well as recruitment rank. Definitely get this when you get the chance. And the ultimate experiment, uh, experiments replaces all your clan, right, clan rat units in the Vermintide with Storm Vermin. Now the Vermintide building combined with all the others can actually take settlements with armies and garrisons in them, as well as a growth and an income boost. If you get all the way to ultimate experience, experiments, though, you're probably already winning the game, but uh, it's really powerful. Um, it, it becomes really fun to just throw up a rat army in the middle of the enemy's lands and take a capital settlement. It's quite fun. So the key for the Skaven technology, though, is to definitely get the unlocks, because at the beginning of the game, you can't research anything. So one of your first things you should do is probably throw down one of these buildings. Depending on what technology you're aiming for, Ruthless Plans or Ferocious Plans. All told, Ferocious Plans is probably going to be more useful early on, unless you're Clan Ashen. Um, so obviously, sorry, for Ferocious Plans, you need the Rattling Warrens, which is your growth building, which you should be using anyway. Okay, I'm doing a little bit out of order, but let's talk about the technology. So if you look at all the Skaven buildings, you will notice that all of them provide food. Uh, sorry, don't provide food. They provide money. Sorry. Um, there's one that provides food, which I can't show you at the moment. But um, every single Skaven building gives you income, meaning it's really hard to say what type of economy buildings you should focus on. Suffice to say, you want to build a garrison building. Skaven garrisons are rather weak. The buff to having the walls as well as access to the warp bomb uh, makes Skaven garrisons last longer. Skaven settlements on the map appear as ruins to everybody else, just like this. So if this is owned by a Skaven, it would appear this way to any enemies. Be aware the AI knows where Skaven settlements are, and you can use heroes to find out where enemy settlements are. 
enemy Skaven settlements are as well. Um, so it can be very important to still have garrisons, especially fighting AIs, because they know where your settlements are. Uh, you can build the Skaven burrows. Honestly, it's not worth building. If it did remove Skaven corruption, it would be, but it doesn't. The only reason you build this is if you're dealing with Nurgle or another Skaven faction that's casting plates on you. Outside of it, don't build it. The odds of you having trouble with Skaven Undercities being the Skaven is pretty low. Um, so how to deal with the Skaven corruption, though, is almost a bigger focus here. Every single building you build gives corruption. The only way you have to deal with it is a Lord's anti-corruption trait. The odds of you using that are pretty low. So what you need to do is build these Taskmaster platforms. All told, at the top, they provide 13 control. Um, these are gonna how you keep order in your provinces. You're probably gonna need at least one or two in each area. One in the major one maxed out, and then maybe even in a minor one. Control and income is relatively nice. Suffice to say, if you play it properly, you shouldn't have the world's greatest trouble. None of the Skaven buildings are massively expensive, as their armies are also dirt cheap. Um, I actually don't know what rank their ports are at. Um, I imagine middle or low. Um, this building here, Scrag Scrap Heap, though, deserves a mention because it does decrease the recruitment cost of your armies. So it makes your money, which should already be good, go that much further. Plus, you need it to get um, the recruitment costs down. So it also lowers other types of corruption in the settlement outside of scaving corruption. So this is kind of your anti-chaos vampiric corruption building. It's kind of a little bit hidden in that sense because none of the others really say what they do. Um, suffice to say, the Skaven don't have the world's worst corruption problems because they very quickly can max out uh, Skaven corruption in their provinces. But if you do want to get it purged quicker, um, build this salvage pit thing and it will deal with them. So basically, for your economy, make sure you build these lookouts, these order buildings, to make sure your settlements have a positive public order. Otherwise, you start suffering penalties um, in your settlements, as well as keeping your food positive. Because once it starts going negative, you seriously start having income problems. Um, as well as construction problems. Your economy revolves around food and order, almost not money, which is rather strange. Okay, time for starting lords and their strategies. So we'll first be covering clan moors. So the unique mechanic here is Queek Headtaker is your legendary lord. He's all about getting to Karak Eight Peaks. This puts him in a race with um, Belliger, Iron Hammer, and Skarsnik to take this settlement right here. You start with an under settlement, uh, under city here, which makes it really easier for you to take than the other two. You're definitely in the best position to get to Karak Eight Peaks out of the racing factions. The downside is your start is a little bit rougher. You start in control of Misty Mountain here. Um, formerly, uh, Queek started down here near Granite Massif. He's been moved up, which is a nice little buff to his race. The downside is you don't start with a capital settlement, meaning you need to take Karak Azgal pretty quickly to get access to the better Skaven stuff. You're in a much more exposed position considering Skarsnik starts right to your south, and he doesn't particularly like you that much. Um, you can buy a non-aggression pact with him on your first couple turns. It's probably worth trying to get that. The downside is inevitably he will turn on you if he survives, but keeping him off your back so you can build up for a while, definitely worth it. To your south, you've got the Silver Host and the Court of Libaris Tomb Kings, both of which you can get non-aggression packs with and potentially even trade with to make some money. Uh, Skaven have trouble um, with trading with factions, so the few trading partners you get, you kind of want to keep. Um, I forgot to mention the Karak 8 Peaks gives you a control problem. Once you get it, though, you'll have access to a pretty powerful, uh, unique building chain in Karak 8 Peaks, and you'll complete the quest, um, which is kind of cool. So what you want to do is quick fight the initial battle. Then you want to withdraw back into your territory. You'll be over here. You want to come back. The reason is, even though you can uh, manually control and fight the battle and as well as take the settlements with low casualties, 
the odds of you doing it, uh, you have to be a decent player. You can't do it with auto resolve. The other downside is if you take the settlement, they start with an army up here. They very quickly build up. It can be very hard to hold Crad Common if you go there and take casualties. If you retreat, however, you can get a much stronger army. So having the Clan Moors Headquarter building gives you food as well as making your clan rats cheaper to build and giving you access to training clan rats. Unlocks recruitment of clan rats. So that means initially clan rats are going to be the host of your army. You start with a catapult as well as a gutter runner slinger and two storm vermin units. Keep those alive because they're the best thing you're going to get for a while. I recommend trading quite a few clan rats. I trained a skaven slave slinger for fun in this case, I guess. And the other thing is you start with the chieftain, but due to Queek's trait here, Nal Wells' right claw. First off, loyalty reduction for great seers, and he steals a percent of experience earned by other lords, not heroes. He has a plus two capacity to chieftains, however. This means, at the start of your turn, you can recruit two chieftains and add him to your army. That's how we have three heroes in his army at the beginning of the game, making his army that much better, considering these are pretty trashy units. Taking Krad Tommen is important. Now, it does start with a clan pit building. I do recommend you repair it. You want to try and get up to Storm Vermin as quickly as possible. You may need them to take Karak Asgall, depending on how things go. Thankfully, you can colonize this at rank 2 or 3 if you want to. Be aware 3 pushes your food negative for a while, which can have its own problems. If you're going to take it, either take it at 1 or take it at 2. If you take it at 3, though, you get Storm Vermin earlier. It's really up to you. Um, I like doing it at 1 because then I can immediately upgrade to two, usually by the time I take it. Outside of that, you're going to want to then, if you can, rush over and take Karak Azgal. Um, be aware that they do have a strong army, and if you lose a lot of units in a siege, you're going to have a problem. Now, if he comes out to raid you, you can attack because the chance of getting an ambush on them is decent. If you get an ambush, the odds are, are you win. Be aware, though, if he brings an army with some backup troops, he's going to be able to beat you, even if you're in the settlement with a garrison. In Misty Mountain, I threw down a garrison building just because I was testing things, but I would probably do a rattling warring to get the growth and casualty replenishment rate. Uh, I wouldn't recommend building any of these advanced buildings. You're going to want to stick them in a capital settlement rather than a minor one. The prize here is Karak Azgal. Once you do, throw down the expansionist right so that you get more food, and that's where you can start building up. I would get a garrison building at ASAP, though, because Scarbrand is to the south, as well as orcs to the north. They don't particularly like you. If you take too long, I've even seen Crooked Moon come south to try and kill you. Now, speaking of Karak Eight Peaks, taking Velaya Sorrow is important. Uh, if you do, sometimes you can lure out their strong army to retake it, um, where you can either get an ambush or run past them to Karak Eight Peaks. Karak Eight Peaks starts with just this underkeep already built. I recommend to start, throw down a Scavenger Raiders as well as a Murder Hole here so that you get an additional food income. Considering how weak the Skaven troops are, you're probably going to want another army on the field rather quickly. In fact, Seeing as I took Prad Tommen, it's probably time to raise another unit here. Queek's whole thing is about warlords, so you want to try and pick one that has a bonus to your infantry. Um, comp capable here, this confident one. Uh, the leadership boost on most people is, you know, kind of funny, but on the Skaven, it's actually useful considering how low their stuff is. You want something decent at fighting, though, or spellcasting. Uh, and you want to get a second army, you can make it up purely of Skaven Slaves. With Queek's army backed up by some Skaven Slaves, you can easily march up and take Karak Eight Peaks. If you want, you can, th instead of building the boost to income and, um, sorry, the boost to food income, you can, in fact, not build those and instead start on the Vermintide building. However, if you are going to do that, you do need to build deeper tunnels and kill purchase first for the 80 reduction. And you might even need to get rid of this underkeep as well. Um, all told, you'll still, if you build all this up, they will detect you. Um, it's up to you, though. This Vermintide will not help you in taking Karak 8 Peaks on its own. You'll need another army. Making this 
much more useful for your attack. Bonus to leadership and uses is really handy. If you want, you can either do underway nexus, but it doesn't make a big difference. Um, it allows lightning strike, but as the Skaven, since you ambush most armies, it's not a real need. Once you take Kara Gate Peaks, it's really where you want to go. I recommend going north. There's another Skaven clan. They're going to be getting killed by um, Thorgrim Grudgebearer or by the Savage Orcs to the west. You'll probably have to deal with the Savage Orcs. The best way to do that is get um, get rattling guns and kill them from a distance. In melee combat, they're going to wreck even your storm vermins. You're going to need access to your high-level Skaven um, machinery as soon as possible, though. Your start is a bit rough. You could also go east here, snag this empty area here, Bitter Bay, um, this as well. Be aware that Clan Carrion here starts in Naga Shizar, um, meaning there will be a fight if you try and go east, but you could do it if you wanted to. I wouldn't recommend going south. You're going to be running across the Tomb Kings. It's much easier to trade with them. Going to the west gets you involved with Manfred, Scarbrand, and um, that whole rumble bowl of Nekahara. And uh, basically, once you complete that, your mission here is to eliminate the faction that controls Karakate Peaks, as well as Skarnik and Belagor Iron Hammer as well, as well as getting 30 settlements and Karakate Peaks. It's not particularly hard to do. Um, Old Skarsnik and Belagor will come for you inevitably, so you can just counterattack and take the settlements they use to get to you. Uh, it's not that hard, honest, in all honesty. So let's look at Queek himself. So we already looked at his traits. Queek is really powerful. First off, Storm Vermin and Clan Rats are cheap upkeep, telling you, of course, he is the Storm Vermin uh, Skaven Lord. He gets a bonus when fighting dwarves and greenskins, as well as a weapon strength and more uses of the menace below, which is all very handy for him. Now, if we look at his default stats here, you'll notice he is an extraordinarily good fighter, not so good on the defense, but he's pretty good at everything else, as well as heavily armored. He can become a one-man army if you want him to. Uh, his biggest weakness, though, is his leadership, in all honesty. Um... So he starts with this pretty standard blue line for the Skaven. It's worth noting here that you have access to both dictatorial and corruptive um, blue line stuff. To start, grab Route Marcher. Then if you want to, I would probably go Ancient Cunning to have a better chance of ambushing armies you attack. Dictatorial here will give you negative three Skaven corruption as well as other corruptions in your provinces. This helps if you're turtling a bit to build up. But the reality is three buildings balance this out. You're much better ignoring this and getting um, the Bell Public Order buildings. I wouldn't get Corruptive, though. It does weaken the enemies, but the odds are you're going to take the land yourself. And then dealing with more Skaven corruption than you have to is just stupid. Draftmaster is huge. Recruitment rank on the Skaven, since they're so trash. Um, having more of them is nice, as well as being able to recruit units that you may lose. Over here, you can kind of ignore Wary. The odds of you getting ambushed as a Skaven is reasonably low, unless you're fighting other Skaven. Quartermaster is quite nice. Um, some of the high-level Skaven machinery units can be expensive. Plus, it just helps you make more money, in all honesty. Right here, all mine, all mine is really nice, nice for the income boost. The magic item is neglectable, renowned, and feared, again, for all those bonuses. I've already talked about it a lot in other guides. Suffice to say, everything there is pretty much worth having. Now, the Skaven have a pretty standard red line. The thing to note here is the Skaven have trouble with leadership. So having these buffs of rally as well as stand or die can be considerably more useful on the Skaven than other factions. Um, it'll keep your units in the fight. The Skaven units have equivalent stats to some of the people you're going to fight. The problem is the leadership. So Inspiring Presence is worth snagging early on on every Skaven Lord for the public, um, for the aura effect of leadership. If you're going to play Queek, it's worth going down Pack Leader early on to get the additional melee attack for Clan Rats until you get Storm Vermin. Once you get Storm Vermin, though, you're going to want to do Respected and Feared. It's a huge buff to all your strong units, Storm Vermin especially. And up top, getting Whip Smart combines your Clan Rat and Storm Vermin bonuses, makes them a lot stronger. 
On the other hand, Skaven are all about their engineering and um, stuff as well. Getting engineering skills can be quite powerful. Up here, gutter-wise, the additional range for some of your range units isn't worth getting, but getting access to Warp Smart, which buffs your artillery slash machinery, is worth it. This is worth taking on another faction, and we'll talk about it when we get there. If you can use the monstrous units, mutagenic elixirs is your way to go. Molder knowledge is not very important. The speed in the charge bonus isn't huge. Um, if you're going to use Skaven Warp teams, they tend to not have immense ammunition problems, but it can help them. So he's got a pretty standard yellow tree. We'll ignore that. First off, let's talk about his unique ones. First off, he weakens loyalty in all the other lords. This is just a little bit of a pain. Loyalty isn't a huge issue if you upkeep a full army and keep your lord happy. It does provide a large leadership buff for his army, making his troops fight better and longer than pretty much all the other Skaven units uh, and lords. Rend and Slaughter gives him frenzy as well as giving him more leadership. Basically makes him fight better and longer. Make Examples gives loyalty to his warlords as well as increases his leadership aura effect. Combined with Inspiring Presence, that's 10 leadership. It's huge. He also causes fear. Life is very cheap is definitely worth getting. It allows your Skaven slaves and clan rats to be recruited higher, gives them armor, and gives casualty replenishment, as well as reduced upkeep on clan rat units. Further on, Crimson Guard. This is your huge buff to Storm Vermin. Again, he's the Storm Vermin Lord. Plus four recruit rank is massive, as well as being able to recruit them in one turn. Violent Rise to Power. Control in all provinces helps a lot with the current Skaven public order issues. The other bonuses are nice as well. The ambush success chance combined with ancient cunning means you should be ambushing basically every army you attack. Sneaky and tricksy are good um, resistance boosts. Warpstone weapon on the other hand makes his attacks magical as well as armor piercing and is definitely worth snagging if you've got a spare point. Now I said Queek can pretty much be a one man army or in this case a one rat man army. Um, that is because he starts with good combat stats, you build him up even further, the boost to weapon strength, armor, and attack are really nice. The biggest downside here of his yellow tree is, despite having immense weapon strength buffs, he only has plus 12 melee defense, meaning your me melee defense is lower than other some, some other legendaries. You do more damage and you attack better, but you don't defend as well. He's good at dueling, not the best at handling enemy troops. Um, trophy heads though is really cool. This is a huge buff to his ability to kill people. Lure, lowers um, melee attack and armor on an enemy lord or hero, meaning you can kill them. He also has a couple abilities here. Um, let's just make sure uh, I did get those two there as well. So ignore these two. because These were items I gained in the first battle. Uh, he also has the running away ability, meaning if he starts wavering, he'll flee the area rather quickly. His quests are quite interesting. Warp Shard Armor gives him ward save, as well as a passive ability that weakens enemies, melee, and armor around him. Uh, this makes him that much better at outdueling lords. The ward save is huge, and the melee defense helps solve one of his problems. Plus, he's going to be one of the heaviest armored units in the game, right up there with Grimgor Ironhide. Dwarf Gouger, on the other hand, is a little bit disappointing. It gives you a bonus when you fight dwarves, as well as cheaper recruitment and a buff. Um, this is good for killing enemy lords, but all told, it feels a little bit weeper, weaker than Warp Shard armor. Anyway, that is Queek Headtaker, kind of the standard bearer for the Skaven. Um, definitely one of the more melee Storm Vermin focused ones. Doesn't mean he can't do the other stuff, he just doesn't have bonuses towards range, artillery, or monsters. On to the next lord. Okay, here we are as Lord Scroll. Of Clan Pestilence, which the name kind of gives it away. This is the plague guy. So you start where a lot of the other Skaven started in the previous games. You start in the middle of Lustria in the jungles. Now you're surrounded basically by people who want to kill you in every direction. One exception is these Skaven over here. I advise getting trade, non aggression, and money from them turn one. It's a nice little buff to your income. They're going to die eventually, but it keeps them off your back. Um, all told, I think it's the safest thing to do at the beginning of the game is this guy. 
So you start in possession of a two settlements, making you a little bit unusual among starters. I recommend throwing down either the putrid rice bog or a growth building. On the other hand, the putrid rice bog is massively powerful. This is a settlement you're going to want to defend at your at the cost of most everything else you have. Food buildings are rare. They only come from pastures where you start with one is massive. All told, six food, growth, casualty replenishment, and most importantly, corruption reduction is massive. Resource buildings tend to do corruption reduction, which is quite nice. But um, honestly, food and everything else makes it the best starting thing to build there. I do recommend probably upgrading it. I might even do it over my capital settlement just so you can get to the um, garrison building that much faster. Since we're here and this is a capital settlement, it's worth noting that the Skaven garrisons start at three, go to five, but they have access to another unique building in a capital settlement. This is the Arcane Generators. Gives a huge buff to income as well as corruption, and you're going to want to throw this down in every major settlement, not because of the income boost, but because of the level two and level three bonuses. Level two is a food generation boost, and level three unlocks ingenious plans, which you need anyway. Um, the food generation is really nice, considering how hard it is to keep up a good solid food income. This makes a world of difference. Um, it makes your capital settlements worth a lot more than uh, you'd expect. Uh, the other thing to note is Lost Valley does have a landmark as well. Oddly enough, it's not built. So they gave you the clan pit instead. Gives even more food, growth, and income from buildings. All told, between this, you get six. From here, you get five. You can have 11 food income basically as soon as you get this to level two. It's pretty nuts. Um, as well as the exotic animal for an additional two and corruption reduction of 13 food early on. You have the most food income of any of the Skavens. You're going to need it though because you're at, at war in all directions. The south, you have Lizardmen. You need to take Sentinel of Time to complete your province. That's as far as I would go south. To the south is more Lizardmen and High Elves. There's another settlement over here, but it's not in your starting region. It's not worth taking. Instead, you're going to want to regroup because to your north, you're going to have trouble with Itza, which lurks right here. One of the stronger Lizardmen factions. They're going to come for your head immediately. Um, this faction right here, this Nurgle faction is going to die, so don't think about them. Further to the north, there is... Um, a corn faction that tends to die. What happens um, before they die, though, um, if they don't die, they tend to become a threat. If they do die, they're ignorable. But a bigger threat is this right here. These are the dwarves of this peak. They lurk right here. You're going to want to take both their settlements. Mine of the Bearded Skulls, you're going to want to fortify as fast as you can because there's a Dark Elf faction lurking right here. Um, Rakarth. Uh, he tends to hate you and come after you. Sometimes you can get a non-aggression pact, but if you can't, he's a problem. There are tomb kings down here that uh, you can either kill or let die to Rakarth. Um, killing them is worth doing if you can, but you also have to deal with um, a pretty powerful lizardman faction to the south and to the north. All told, you're going to be on a pretty defensive gameplay style for, his what, for a while. Now, you have the food to help you with your growth and everything else, um, which makes it much easier. But now let's talk about Skrulk and his start. First off, chance of your plague spreading, 100%. This is really huge. You're going to be wanting to use plagues a lot. Your plagues bolster your forces, meaning they get stronger and make your settlements grow faster. It's cheaper to build the pox buildings, which if we pull up here, this is how you get your plague monks, which are a decent frenzy unit. Um, Skrulk is all about this tree here, Fox Cauldron. You can build it faster and cheaper. It'll spread your corruption to the nearby areas, reducing your benefit, but also hindering the enemies. It's probably the one of the few Skaven Lords where actually having Skaven corruption in neighboring provinces is a good thing for you in the long run. Now, he also gets a right cooldown of 15 turns for the Pestilent Scheme. Considering it's 15 turns, um... It's a 
it's better than it was 30 for everybody else. You're going to want to use this quite a lot. It's reasonably cheap. Summon this on the enemies to weaken them before you invade. Your first target, in my opinion, should be up here, hitting Itza. Be aware you have to get the Pox Cauldron build it first, meaning that should be one of your priorities. If you kill off Itza, you're really safe to the north. Your biggest threats might come from the Vampires, the Bretonians, and the Empire, but you will have a breathing space. Then you should immediately turn your attention south or west and take over the rest of the south of, or west of Lystria. The, hot, the Dark Elves over here are worth killing at some point, but your bigger threat is more likely to be either the other Skaven, which can sometimes turn on you. I don't tend to find they do. But the Vampire Coast, Bretonia, and the Empire are a more existential threat. They're honestly a bigger threat than the Lizardmen, who you'll be able to hit with a plague and then take out. Also, cool little reference to the Nazca lines here. Um, just pointing that out. Now, Skrulk himself is an interesting character. He's a decent melee fighter, being a plague monk. Um, but his big thing is he's a spellcaster. He has access to Pestilent Breath and Bless with Filth at the beginning. They're worth using when you can. His traits are he spreads more Skaven corruption in his own lands, which is public order problems, but eh, what can you do? He gets a huge upkeep um, decrease for basically anything that has to deal with plague. So your monks, your uh, sensor bearers, your catapult. Um, that's a little odd, but you get the catapult it's worth using, as well as plague priest hero units. Um, all told, you're all about the plagues, really. Um, the fact that this guy isn't considered a Nurgle faction or has relation bonuses with Nurgle is kind of weird. Uh, although, to be fair, his plagues are Horned Rat Plagues rather than Nurgle Plagues. You're going to want to do the standard blue line. Getting access to Draftmaster and Renowned and Feared is even more important. If you're having Skaven Trouble Corruption, this might be the guy to grab Dictatorial on just so that you don't cause huge problems when you're in your lands. Or you could double down and go Corruptive and really mess up your enemy. Remember that Skaven Corruption in enemy provinces does give you more access to the Menace below army ability, though, which is quite nice. You've got your pretty standard uh, red line here. It's worth noting that Snagging, Renowned, and Feared will buff your Plague Monks, which you'll have other bonuses to as well. You have access to the, Sca the general Skaven spells here. Uh, Pestilent Breath is way stronger than it appears at first. Um, Plague Rash really weakens the enemies. Plague in general is pretty strong, and Pestilent Birth summons a flanking unit of Plague Monks. So if you summon this behind enemies, Plague Monks are good at flanking, so they charge in and do a lot of damage. Um, up top here, he does have a standard yellow line, similar to Queek. He can become stronger. He'll never be the one-man army that Queek does, because he doesn't have the army, but he can be a decent melee fighter as well. Uh, I'd put him in the mid-tier of melee fighters, but he's also a spellcaster. And honestly, I'd build him more towards um, spellcasting than melee, just because his melee traits aren't massive. Now, he has Loathsome Appearance, which causes terror, which is worth snagging. He also gets this huge ability to recruit Plague Priests and Eshin Sorcerers, as well as boost and start with higher Plague Monks and Plague Claw Catapults, as well as making them cheaper, all told. Um, it stacks nicely with your upkeep, meaning that you should definitely be using Plague Monks where you can. Um, Plague Monks, their weakness is that they're not necessarily the strongest melee units you get, but your bonuses make them worth using more than some other factions. Definitely once you get this ability though, Plague Lord, start summoning those Plague Priests. You want them on the map. Um, they will contribute a lot of spell casting to it, meaning that if you want, you could build this guy yellow and then use them. I still recommend casting him as a spell. Now, he has Herald of Decay, which is a huge bust, Skaven Corruption, um, spreading. It also weakens control in enemy provinces. Remember, he already spreads three, so now this is spreading eight. Corruptive, you could spread 11 per turn. Um, you can cause revolts just standing in enemy provinces. It's quite fun. Horned Rat, this is a huge buff to leadership, stacks amazingly well with Inspiring Presence. Basically, it solves all the... Um, leadership problems of the Skaven, so long as you're in the area. Envoy of the Council, oh, okay, available at rank 13 is a bit of a joke. Um, 
more relations with Skaven. The downside is there's not a lot of Skaven near you and they tend to die, but hey. Aura of Pestilence weakens enemies in an area. All told, if you go for a combat version, Aura of Pestilence makes you that much stronger. Warpstone tokens. While it does give you a large 13 boost to Winds of Magic growing, uh, it also adds a base miscast chance. So if you do take that, be aware you probably want to snag Earthling. Otherwise, some of your spells, you'll have a higher than you would like chance of miscast. Plague right here has a pretty good miscast chance already. No need to make it worse. Now, quest is quite interesting. Um, first off, it decreases the time between your rights even more. Um, you'll be able to get it like every 12 turns. You'll even spread even more corruption. Now you're looking at 14 corruption in a province. And you have access to the Liber Bubonicus, which is a damaging enemy spell. It's good against lords and heroes. It does a decent amount of damage. You get two casts the battle. Definitely use it. Uh, you also recruit Plague Priest higher, meaning you'll get them at like level 7. And Plague Spells are even cheaper for you to get. Uh, if you haven't figured out, the guy is all about plague, including casting plagues. Now over here, more capacity makes him much better in melee combat. Decrease his wither costs so that you can really strip armor from people. And Rod of Corruption is again another damaging. Uh, this is for units. This is for like heroes as well. Uh, both are worth getting. It makes him a unusual legendary lord that both of his quests are actually worth doing. Um, and that's pretty much it, is him. His start is rather rough, but if you succeed, you have more food and more corruption than you'll know what the heck to do with. Um, it's quite possible that you sit at plentiful food almost the whole game. Definitely try and keep the food high. When you take Itza, pour as much food as you can in it to get it to a higher settlement. And definitely put garrisons in your starting two settlements. The fact they have food buildings makes them invaluable to you, and you do not want to lose Sabatun at any point. The dwarves in particular sometimes will jump in and try and snipe it. Be aware though, if you try and build a garrison without troops in the settlement, the enemy tends to see that as, oh, I can take a settlement and declare a war just to stop you from putting a garrison down, which I don't know if they're going to patch, but right now is really strange. On to the next lord. Okay, here we are with Hatch Craven Tail. Of Clan Rictus. Now he has migrated all the way over from where Nagarond is back to his home in Crookback Mountain. So this is a very odd Skaven faction all the way around. It doesn't have any unique per se mechanics. It's just the way it plays. This almost makes him more vanilla than Queek. So he is located right here at the edge of the desolation of Asgoth. Um, he's pretty close to. Um, the High Elf faction over here to the north, there's some greenskins. The dwarves lurk right over here. Karag Eight Peaks is to the south, just to orient you where he is. So his major threat is, ironically, the High Elves over here under the Knights of Kalidor, um, or whatever they're called. Uh, they can become a major threat. They're probably the first people you want to wipe out. But the reality is you're facing people who are likely to invade you on all sides. So Strategic gameplay is definitely a necessity for this faction. So you want to take Mount Greyhag and Darkhold. There's a strategic location here, but not for you, unfortunately. But uh, if you let uh, the Kalidor faction get it, they start making a lot more money. So don't let them get that. Uh, it can be rather problematic if they do. They're down here, though. So as long as you don't cross here, you can delay the length of time till they attack you. If they do attack, they're by and large going to attack this direction up here. Um, Crookback Mountain is actually semi-defendable. Um, the downside is it doesn't block any major paths, paths, so people tend to waltz right past you. So let's look at um, Crookback Mountain. You start with the Rictus Great Clan Hall, meaning all your storm vermins are immune to psychology. While this guy has slightly different traits than Queek, he's still about the Storm Vermin. They recruit better, and they're cheaper, as well as he trades. Um, the benefit of this is you have a bigger access to people to trade with than some of the other Skaven. If you work it right, you can even trade with people like Cathay, given time. Um, 
definitely more trade. Also, it's a nice little boost to income and food, which is good because there are no pastures anywhere near you, really. You're in the middle of a wasteland desert. So Tetch's other bonus, scurry away ability. If you look on units, they, it's been buffed. Um, scurry away it now gives a ward save and you move faster, meaning that your units, if they start running away, take less damage before they rally in combat. Uh, it's quite nice considering how often the Skaven units run away. His other bonus, he has Encourage, meaning that your Skaven units provide a leadership to nearby allies, solving a lot of your leadership problems. Um, it's very nice. Uh, you gain control whenever a diplomatic treaty is broken. So if you're struggling keeping public order, betray people <laughs> and break those treaties. It can keep you much more stable and your Storm Room recruited a higher rank. Combined with your Rictus Clan Hall, your Storm Vermin will be level 5 as soon as you get them, making racing to get them a priority for this faction more than the other Skaven. Um, be aware that there are other buffs that you can snag down here. You, these are the techs you want to focus with. This is a... We have an elite core of Storm Vermin faction backed up by um, the standard Skaven artillery and mechanical units so let's look at tretch or tet tretch himself i can never figure out how you say his name uh he's got the standard blue line for the skaven you're going to want to get ancient cunning you're going to be attacked from multiple directions so being able to ambush them um, is even more useful as well as the increased recruit rank plus two suddenly your skaven vermin are storm vermin are almost level seven or eight as soon as you recruit them, which is just absolutely nuts considering they're a good infantry unit to begin with. Uh, Quartermaster though is almost a necessity on him just because of how expensive maintaining storm vermin armies is. Um, I really wouldn't worry too much about wary. Lightning strike might be worth taking, but the odds are you're gonna be ambushing the armies, so it's not as needed. Um, he has his traits here are rather interesting. I wanted to cover the blue lines here because of the ambushes. Um, Vanguard for all his units, meaning you can deploy them virtually anywhere on the map, allowing for some very interesting flanks and combos. He also has a melee attack during ambushes up, which is great. If you take the additional ambush chance, you'll have a 15% more chance than normal of ambushing. Uh, you're going to get a lot of ambushes, and when you do, your Storm Vermin will be absolutely monstrous. Now, if you get attacked and you retreat, you also get a bonus, meaning it's quite viable to run away from battles. Rather than fighting battles, you will just barely win, like Pyrrhic victories. It can be worth running away from um, to get the additional attack. If they pursue you, you'll win better than the Pyrrhic victory you would before. If they don't pursue you, you can chase them the next turn and ambush them. This is a faction where running away is a whole lifestyle rather than just what the Skaven normally do. Now, looking at Tretch here, you'll notice he has really good melee defense, not so great melee attack. He can become a bit of a one-man tank army. Uh, if you max out his blade shield and everything else, he's really hard to kill. He's got this trophy heads, similar to Queek, which allows him to weaken enemy lords. His other abilities here, he gets income from raiding, his storm vermin get a charge bonus, and Tretch Rager buffs allies around if they're winning melee combat. Um, so basically, if you win, you win hard. If you start losing, well, you have some trouble. Uh, but your Skaven storm vermin charge is really nice. Master of Guiles increases your ambush success and defense chance combined with ancient cunning. And if you want to do wary, you're going to be basically immune to ambushes and you'll be ambushing everybody. Um, this game and also have access to the underway. I haven't mentioned it that much because it's pretty obvious. Um, the evasion chance is nice. Vanished here, you get additional movement range after you win a battle, which allows for a lot of counter invasions. If the enemy invades you, you attack, you pursue, and you take them. It also makes your storm vermin not immune to range, but really hard to damage, and they move faster. Stay here, I get help is just kind of hilarious. Basically, it makes Tretch stock and unspottable and buffs the allies' leadership he's leaving behind, even if you don't bring uh, him back to the battle. Um, 
It's kind of like, stay here and fight and die. I'll say I'm getting help, but I'm not actually getting it. And then finally, coming back, casualty replenishment as well as regeneration. All told, while he is not as, say, good at killing things as Quick Headtaker, he's very hard to kill. He's quite capable of outdueling enemy lords just by outlasting them. And finally, life is cheap, makes Skaven slaves armored and cheaper, as well as giving a nice casualty replenishment to your whole army. It's definitely worth snagging for the casualty replenishment rate, as well as coming back. Um, since there is no blue line healing for the Skaven, combined helps you maintain a large, healthy army. His quest, he gets one. The Lucky Skull, skull Helm, it provides a bonus to your allies, mainly him if he starts losing a battle. He gets a huge ward save and movement, making him even harder to kill, as well as a physical resistance, and makes your chance of ambushing higher. All told, even though you're surrounded on all sides, once you get all your ambush abilities and you have a full core of storm vermin and elite art artillery units, you can pretty much hold your own. You might not be able to expand much, but despite being a person surrounded, you're really hard to eliminate from the game. Definitely throw a garrison building in Crookback Mountain though once you get it. You don't want to lose it and it's where you want to recruit all your storm vermin. All told, you build it up, you ambush nearby. Kretsch sitting next to Crookback Mountain with a garrison is probably one of the stronger and harder factions to actually eliminate. You'd have to get an ambush on him or have insane ambush defense in order to wipe him out completely. Not necessarily the best at expanding. Be aware that if you go too far to the east, you'll run across Gorse and the Nurgle faction. Whichever survives is a problem for you. They're both melee units. Your storm vermin will absolutely wreck them. If you go east, be aware the dwarves are a pain. You're going to want storm vermin with halibards. If you go to the north, you'll run across Skarsnik and other greenskins. can be a bit of a pain. Given time, Grimgor Ironhide tends to come over. Basically, everybody around you is either good at melee or heavily armored, making your storm vermin with halibards much more useful than the ones with sword and shields. Don't lose these starting ones. It'll be a while before you get new ones. Definitely use the assassins build up. Once you get a chieftain put in your army, it's a huge buff. And overall, have fun defending. Um, dominating scheme is going to be one of your big fan, your biggest helps here for the food. Since your food isn't a great success for you, and it's quite viable to set up under cities everywhere. If you send your warlock all the way over to Cathay and then do the mining one or the mountains of Morn here. Um, you can definitely set up one heck of an underway network. It's quite fun. Uh, sadly, no other real Skaven. Queek is a possible confederation if he survives. If you go east, you might find Clan Ashen. Other than that, you're pretty much on your own, which considering how much uh, this guy betrays and runs away is perfectly normal. And anyway, that's it for him. On to the next Lord. Okay, here we are. As Ikit Claw, the really nutty Skaven of Clan Scryer. So he, first off, we already did the initial um, take over the nearby settlement battle, by the way. Um, just to show you where we are. I forgot I was recording, honestly. Um, so uh, Ikit Claw starts in possession of Skaven Blight, which is kind of the Skaven home city. Um, it's a powerful settlement. It's massive. I think it's the largest settlement in the game with 12 dev slots. Um, it's going to be the source of most of your power and units for pretty much the whole game. So it has a couple unique landmarks. The first one you start with is a warp stone telescope where you can observe the dark moon, which is apparently made of warp stone. It allows you access to all the good clan rat units. Basically, you don't have to build a barracks unless you want access to chieftain or storm vermins, which of course... Ikit Claw can avoid. Once you upgrade it, it gives you access to some of your decent artillery units. The reality is you want to build this, but you also want to do the artillery stuff. Also, it gives you food, income, and research rate, and the description is probably my favorite one in the game. Only the most reckless individual would dare attempt to somehow pull celestial objects out of the sky. Cue Ikit Claw. Uh, you basically start trying to pull meteors to the earth to get warp stone. It's pretty crazy. Um, he's totally nuts. He's an insane engineer, like, 
very rarely seen in fiction. Um, he's totally nuts. Up top, since this is the home of the Skaven, you have access to the Council Chamber of 13, which gives a nice control boost faction-wide as well as 13. Ha ha ha, it's again showing up. You think the devs realize the Skaven's like 13 maybe? Um, recruitment, corruption, income, and global recruitment capacity are all nice buffs, as well as the Shattered Tower, which is the bell of the Horned Rat, allows you to expand the Under Empire faster, considering once you expand it, there's a cooldown. This helps a lot. And it also massively spreads Skaven corruption in its own province and nearby ones. Don't expect not to be fully corrupted and stay that way for most of the game. However, if you get manage to get the Council Chamber of the 13 combined with a Temple of Horn Rat, you can be fully corrupted and still have no public order problems. It would be very weird for the Skaven to have issues in their own homeland. So Ikit Claw has a host of unique mechanics, which we will get into, but let's first cover him and his traits. So first off, he has access to the Forbidden Workshop, a unique trait. He researches faster, his recruits are more loyal, building engineer buildings is cheaper, which is nice because this guy's all about insane science. And his personal stats are quite interesting. So he starts with the iron frame, starting with a unique one, spell resistance, physical damage, armor, and weapon strength. Um, if he doesn't look slightly crazy, that's because you probably don't know what crazy looks like. Um, his big thing here is he's the right, fa uh, right fang of Lord Morskitar. Um, Cheaper upkeep on your mid-level um, weapons, uh, artillery weapons and the like, as well as your Skaven weapon teams recruited at a higher level. Now, he starts with an ability called Brass Orb, which doesn't look amazing. It's a free-use Vortex spell, basically. He throws it, it can do some nasty damage. You're going to want to use it a lot. He also has the ability to cap warp, cast Warp Lightning, as well as the Howling Warp Gale as well. Warp Gale is only good on flying units, but it's pretty useful if you can pin them down for your range units to kill them. He's got a standard blue line. Get Draftmaster, get Renowned Feared, probably get Quartermaster. His units are expensive. Ignore Dictorial and Corruptive, get Ancient Cunning, and probably Bonded Service instead. For his red line, you're definitely going to want Engineering Skill and probably um, Blastmaster as you go along. Warp Smart is huge on him, as well as Gutter Wise. Although Gutter Wise isn't as big on him, but it can be a nice little buff. Most of his strength comes from his machineries, which don't have as many um, strengths. Can be worth snagging Pack Leader here, or Respected and Feared, so that you actually have an infantry line that doesn't die. You're going to want to use a lot of Storm Vermins with shields or Halibards. Although you can get away with Clan Rats with Spirits. His spells are varied. He gets Flensing Ruin, Cracks Call, as well as Warp Lightning. Those are, and Scorch, are pretty good damage. He also gets some buffs as well. Unlimited Power is pretty much... Unlimited Power corrupts the already totally corrupted utterly. Uh, gets him more magic. He can cast more spells than you'd expect. He has two unique lines, so we'll go over them in order. First one, this buffs his combat rather than a yellow line. He gets a physical resistance. Some basic combat, spell, fire resistance. He gets a jetpack that doesn't really work. Uh, he can't actually fly. Biometric in face, he gets tankier. And then he can either heal himself with a melee defense or get a damage and unbreakable for 15 seconds. The reality, though, is snag power armor and maybe double insulation. The rest of these pretty much ignore. He is His combat stats are so low, he's never going to be a good fighter. Um, although once he gets Doom Wheel, he can be a little bit more effective. He's much better as a spellcaster slash insane scientist than he is a fighter. He also has Power Overload. He gets more spells. He can recruit Warlock war lock Masters easier, as well as Warlock Engineers. Improved Warpstone Detectors. He has a chance of getting Warp Fuel after battle, a unique mechanic. The very latest thing, um, his, his range which he starts as a ranged user, basically firing Warp Flame, gets more um, damage in range, as well as basically burns elite anti-large units, some monsters and lords. He also has access to Doom Flares and Doom Wheels faster 
apparently not higher rank. And Doomsday Scientist buffs his Brass Orb, makes it significantly stronger. It's not bad to begin with, but it's a huge buff to damage per second. Um, you're going to want to use it, throw it down in a lot of battles. He gets Doom Flare and Doom Wheel. Get Doom Wheel. The um, range is better. Be aware, though, when he gets on the Doom Wheel, yes, he gets more ammunition and slightly better combat stats and stuff. He loses access to his insane damage um, as a range unit. So take your pick. Don't leave him on the Doom Flare, though. It weakens his combat stats, and he doesn't make up for it. His quests, Storm Demon, uh, Control in All Provinces, as well as a Spell, Magic Missile, is quite nice. It buffs his combat, but as we said, he's not a fighter. He's a scientist, even though he has decent resistances. So, let's talk about his unique mechanics. He still has food, he still has all the other Skaven stuff, but he has the Forbidden Workshop. So, he has Warp Fuel, which you will sometimes get after battles, hero actions, missions, and if you upgrade the Workshop, this are used to buy upgrades, which is quite useful in the Workshop. He also has access to Doom Rockets, think nuclear weapons. I'm not kidding. He basically has the ability to build nukes. Not to the level of the real world nukes where they destroy cities, more like wreck armies. I managed to drop one of these on an enemy army of elite Bretonian cavalry in a game once, and I killed about 400 questing knights with one of them. It was kind of amazing. <laughs> um, it was a huge battle. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about that. He's still got the standard rights, so I'm not going to even bother with those. Forbidden Workshop, though. So this is where he makes the already powerful sk Skaven machinery units that much better. Um, first off, Doom Rockets. This is the true strength of his ability. Uh, he can only hold a certain amount, although he can up the capacity given time. He pays food and warp, uh, warp fuel to get upgrades. He starts with the Doom Rocket, but you only want to use it in a desperate situation. You can buy various upgrades. I recommend getting Toxic Weight Salvage at the beginning. If you use Doom Rocket, you'll get fuel, which could potentially be used to build another Doom Rocket later on. Um, interestingly enough, this is glitched because it does cost warp fuel a little bit. Um, Refined Warp Stone is pretty nice as well. Get a chance of a second one. If you want more damage, if you want casualty replenishment, honestly, I don't really use these two that much. Increased storage limit gives you silos that you can then drop on more people, as well as a warp plant, which helps you get more chain uh, winds of magic. Uh, all told, this is the huge strength of this faction. All told, I think this is the strongest Skaven faction due to the buffs to already powerful machinery. Now, your Doom players, as you can see, Kind of like a, a wheel here where the Skaven rides behind. You can upgrade this a variety of different ways. I like warp flares early on because it allows a, um, the ability to randomly cast warp lightning as well as do an explosion. Um, it's quite nice. Uh, all characters on Doom Flares get it. Um, considering some of your heroes will be on Doom Flares, can be nice. Uh, this is a buff to its. Infantry combat, considering it's an anti-infantry unit already, quite helps, as well as a boost to weapon strength. If you remember when I talked about units, I said their combat stats aren't the best. Well, Ikit Claw makes them the best. This one boosts to Winds of Magic. This one has the ability to decrease the cost of Wind of Magic spells on people. Uh, be aware that you do have to level up the workshop a bit before you can uh, gain access to some of these. This one, huge buffs to leaderships as well as an aura to nearbys. Propeller blade, now it ruins armor of people it attacks as well as missile. It's much more useful then. A ward save, it's huge as well as melee defense. And then stalk, somehow this thing can move unseen in terrain. Micro reactors, we've already talked about. All told, once you upgrade this as well, you also unlock these various bonuses as well. Um, this power armor thing is pretty huge as well. Um, once you get it, the Black Hole Flares is a regiment of renown, and it's definitely worth building once you get access to it. Doom Wheels, a similar thing. Remember, this is more anti-large than anti-units. Uh, 
So reloads, this has shoots warp lightning out of these in a very gothic type thing. Speed, reload time, missile resistance, armor, melee defense, strider. All of these are worth taking at some point. Um, double shot is really cool. The ability to get two lightning strikes at once is pretty awesome. Splinter Prisms, this buffs characters, gives them a chance to do it as well, as well as strengthening missile damage. Perfect Vigor, these things never tire, they're really hard to kill. Spell Resistance, one of their few weaknesses is spells, this solves that problem. And this basically allows you to cast more Warp Lightning, which is always cool. Warp Lightning is a rather strong spell in my opinion. And then you have the weapons teams. So you got your rattling guns. I recommend if you're going to use rattling guns, you get onboard waste capacitor compactor almost immediately. It basically allows you to have infinite ammo, which is really cool. Um, if your ammo goes below 80, you will replenish it, meaning you shoot forever. Rattling coolant decreases the reload time, buffing them even stronger. And then claw crafted bullets makes them amazingly better in range damage, which they're already one of the best units. Warp fires, if you're going to use them, this can be a huge buff. Concentrated flames is um, really good at burning uh, monsters or lords, as well as cav. Warp lock jazals, though, I would focus on. So I would do rattling guns, then warp lock jazals, ideally. Um, hawkish precision, more damage if nobody's nearby. Missile resistance and stalk, which is just kind of crazy, allows for great flanks. Craven round gives them... They're already large range, a much larger one, as well as more armor piercing damage. If you remember way back when I talked about how the warp grinder units were terrible, this is where they become not terrible. If you get star metal talons plus 30 attack, they start with something like 17 or less. So 30 makes them significantly better at combat. 13 visions gives them an ability, if they have low hit points, to gain a ward save, making them actually capable of surviving in melee combat, as well as giving them regeneration and expendable, meaning they charge in, they do decent damage, they get a ward save, and they heal, and they're expendable so you don't care about them. They can double as a... Um, right up there with clan rats as a melee unit, except they do more damage. Also, as you build up here, you'll unlock a variety of different things. Getting the Doombringers, the, the, all these regiments of renown are amazing. Death Dealers is really powerful. Um, all told, getting incendiary rounds, you want to stick this on your rattling gun when you unlock it. You can only put it on one, but it's a huge boof. Or your worth lock, Warp Lock Jazals. I prefer it on the rattling gun myself. This one should be stuck on your Warp Lock Jazals, probably to give them more missile strength. And all told, you're going to want to be upgrading that uh, laboratory as time goes on. It's really powerful. Be aware that if you use this scheme of doom, this warlock engineer, you can create an undercity. The undercity you create is a laboratory undercity, which gives even more buffs to this type of faction. And it's pretty fun. So in terms of your starting location, you start next to Talea here. Uh, you can, with a little bit of effort, get a non-aggression pact. The reality is they'll declare war on you. Um, you start at war with Estalia. Be aware there is a Beastman army here. Skaven and Beastman get along half decently, so you can sometimes get a non-aggression pact. The downside is they tend to stick a herdstone down, which makes it a little bit difficult to expand in the area, since they try to raise the settlements. Um, Getting Magrita down here is an ideal target if you can pull it off. Ah, here we go. I can actually show you that the Skaven are not the best at, um, at sea. Their income from ports is relatively low. On the other hand, it's a building that doesn't give corruption, which is nice. Um, basically, if you can, you want to try and either eliminate or take over the Beastman's area here, gain control of this full area. Um, be aware there's a new settlement out here, so you can snag these two, or you can get three complete regions. Skaven Blight is, in fact, its own region, which is kind of cool. So the first thing you should do is definitely do either efficient planning or exploitive to unlock edicts and rights. Um, all told, growth is what you're going to want to sit on a long time. You want Skaven Blight to be maxed out on size as soon as possible. Once you deal with this area, you can either turn on and take out uh, Tilea. My experience, Sartosa tends to kill them first. 
You can get a non-aggression pact with them. They tend to stay loyal to it, as long as you don't cause much trouble for them. They will hold down your left flank. Basically, Skaven Blight here takes a couple turns to walk to, and if you throw a garrison in it with the size and power of Skaven Blight on its own, it's pretty untakeable, um, or else you'll get warnings. Meaning, the next route of expansion is north into Britonia. The Fey Enchantress is a loud, logical target. Once you take Castle Carcassonne, you've got a choice. You can go after the Wood Elves, who will probably declare war on you, or you can go after Britonia, or Grom, who will all declare war on you. Your victory conditions is to kill her, as well as level up the Forbidden Workshop, as well as make sure Talea and Estalia are dead. Talea will die on their own. Estalia tends to die to the Beastmen, which means your only real problem is uh, the Fey Enchantress to the north, Carcassonne. Um, all told, you have probably one of the best starts of the Skaven, because you start with a massive settlement. You research quickly. The goal early on is to get into the research, so you get the bonuses. Um, can be very powerful. I love their late game fact um, that they have insane machines. They're definitely probably my favorite Skaven faction. Um, there's something about insane scientists, and you get decent food, meaning you can easily control this area without too many penalties. And considering the resources, you can even keep the Skaven uh, corruption decently low. It's still going to build up, but it helps. And anyway, that is Ikit Claw. On to the next lord. All right, here we are. Time for sneaking scab stabbing. Now, all you total uh, uh, Vermintide players just looked around for a gutter runner. This is the gutter runner faction, Deathmaster Snitch. This is Clan Eshin, the clan of the assassins and everything else, with a host of unique mechanics as well as a unique technology, which I will point out. They have quality and quantity. Um, this is a big change because it allows any unit that hits rank 7 to um, get a huge buff to melee attack and defense. On the other hand, the upkeep of all your units go up. But the big leadership boost as well as the other bonuses are nice. Um, this allows the clan Eshens to have um, the most disciplined and in terms of pure numbers, the strongest Skaven units. Now, interestingly enough, Clan Eshin here has access to the shadowy dealings, but the biggest problem they have is recruitment class plus 200% for all non-Eshin units. There are a lot of non-Eshin units in your build. First off, your barracks here, these are non-Eshin units. These are Eshin units. These are non-Eshin units. Um, basically everything that's not this tree, you'll have a penalty towards recruiting. Uh, making this turn into a ranged ambushing sniping faction you're not melee combat you're not really artillery thankfully you've got deathmaster snitch who's probably one of the strongest lords on the other hand your eshin lords have no loyalty which is really nice and your night runners and gutter runners are armor piercing with warp stone infused projectiles making them really good at what they do so Deathmaster Snitch, which used to be over near the Knights of Kalidor area, has now migrated all the way to Cathay. I imagine we'll see a bit of a rework with this, because right now it feels like he was just stuffed in here, rather than actually having a point to being over here. So, he's got the Clan Eshin headquarters, allows you to get devious plans from the beginning, making you honestly get a head start on all the other Skaven. Control, growth, and food. Again, growth is 13. So start with devious plans. You want to get to uh, fight dirty and probably all the way to abduct promising candidates as well as intensive training at some point. You're going to want your gutter runners and stuff and night runners as soon as possible and as strong. So since you start as a minor settlement, one of your first targets should be Kulan. You're not going to get it first. Fight the initial battle, retreat, recruit, take village of the moon. If they come to defend it, if you park your army like right here they tend to rush to defend this settlement you can sneak in and take kulan kulan then becomes the center of your production and development and you should honestly build it to um, put a garrison in it considering at that point you'll be surrounded there'll be uh, Cathay, the dragon lady to the north there'll be the dark elves to the right to the south are vampires and other Cathay, and to the west you'll have um, the dragon guy over there 
Now, Zingpo does start with gem mining shaft, which can be worth building. I recommend, however, you ignore that and go straight for the hidden lair. That way you can actually recruit some of your good units. Because at the start, you're stuck with Skaven Slaves, and guess what? They don't have a recruitment penalty because they're so wimpy, basically. Uh, early on, just bring the spears as uh, lumps of it, and then you're going to have to rely on your range units to actually get kills. This is a faction that, if you are good at micro-commanding it, they're way stronger than if you go for auto results. Okay, let's look at their unique mechanics, then we'll get into the other stuff. So they have access to shadowy dealings, and there are two types of shadowy dealings. There's the Eshin actions, which are very powerful, and then there's the clan contracts, which have been changed a bit and are slightly more annoying. Uh, we'll go over the Eshin actions first. First off, Night Lords say so. Basically, um, in order to complete Snitch's campaign, you have to do it several times. Uh, it increases the number of schemes. If you start with one, you can get up to five from the beginning. Uh, it also makes him have a longer recovery time. You need to use him to complete it. Um, there are some other criterias as well. On these other ones, though, down here are all minor, and they require a different level of schemes. The first one to start with is Food Raid. You'll just gain five food from a settlement every 10 turns. This allows you to actually not have as many food problems as the other Skaven, obviously outside of Clan Pestilence, which has more food than they know what to do with. The cool thing is you target a settlement and you can select an agent. In this case, we have Snitch. We can immediately confirm it. And what it does is it gives us five food, but it also, at the start of the game, levels up Snitch to level two immediately. You should be basically using one of the Eshin actions. Small Heist is really good, as well as um, uh, Burglarize and stuff early on. You can also stash rations if for some reason you need your schemes back, but why would you? Um, other than the fact that you could level up Snitch faster. It allows Snitch to level up pretty much better than any other lord in the game. It's quite possible to have a level 20 Snitch like 20 turns into the game. It's hilarious. So he's got a standard blue line. He's got a standard red line. It's worth noting you're going to want to do infiltrators to buff your uh, clan Eshin. Night runners and gutter runners. It's not huge. The reload time isn't amazing, but you want to get to gutter wise as soon as you can, which also boosts your Eshin triads. Respected and feared, uh, you're going to want for the death runners and Eshin triads. The reason I'm mentioning those two units is they are your two melee units that are part of Clan Eshin. They're not particularly good, although he buffs them more than the others. You've got your melee one, and then you've got your anti cav and large unit ones, neither of which hold up that long in combat. Um, they're not really designed to. They're more damage dealers than line holders, meaning you have to deploy them properly and use your range units to pepper the enemy first. This is also a faction where knowing the difference between night runners and night runners with slings is huge. In my experience, you want the ones without slings that can fire while moving because you don't have a front line to hold the enemy, so you're going to be running away from them a lot. Um, you start with a war Warlock Engineer, and you're going to want to max him out on the damage spells pretty much as soon as you can, as well as getting him to um, buff uh, Missile Strength in the army. Um, Arms dealer, ammo, as well as triangulation, standard firing drill, are huge buffs. Ballistic instructor. Since you're a range infantry faction, anything that makes them stronger is better. Um, you're never going to win a head-on fight. Considering how you're designed, you're not meant to. So, let's look at Deathmaster Snitch himself. So, he has... An agitator, he's better at ambushing, he's got the ability of concealment bombs, and any heroes in his army attack better. Concealment bombs, you basically, you're on stock and unspottable, meaning you can easily get to lords or backlines and then kill things, as well as if you kill them, you can then proc this and run away. Uh, very micro heavy. If you snag slippery, you even gain a speed boost if you use it. Um, making him very useful at running deep behind the enemy lines, killing something, assassinating lords, and then fleeing. 
that's even buffed further by the fact that he's got really good combat stats, as well as the Weeping Blade, which ruins enemies' armor. If you take all this, he becomes not a one-man army, because he's never going to be that strong without the armor. But the Deathmaster's sigil here, he grounds an enemy, and then he absolutely kills them. He's probably the best lord or hero killer in the game without any of the insane scaling or the Sword of Cain. Uh, pretty much one-on-one, -on -one, he's going to be able to outduel most anybody if played properly. Up top, he's got From the Shadows, which is allows him to affect all his army, making them gain Snipe, Stalk, and Unspottable, meaning for the 58 seconds this ability lasts, the units he drops it on, can fire while range, they can move in any terrain, and they're unspottable. This allows you to actually fight enemy archers, because they can't return fire while you run up and pepper them. It's really nice, especially with your Skaven, which are faster than your average infantry. They just keep running away and shooting, and the enemy is left confused as they're dying from what appears to be nothing but a hail of um, arrows and other stuff from the darkness. Now, he's got some of the, in my opinion, stronger uh, Lord buffs. First off, ambush bonuses go up all the way around. Enemy leadership goes down. Your units get a weaker version of... Um, Clan Rictus's ambush bonuses, leadership and melee attack, which is nice, even though you're, you shouldn't really be in melee combat that often. The leadership is huge. You get a further movement as well as striding. If you do go into melee combat, you get a nice charge bonus. Conceal hide them. Your infantry moves faster, stacks amazingly well with hit and run. Basically, it makes your army move 20% faster than they appear to already, which is fast. Contract loopholes, cheap upkeep, as well as lords and heroes get recruited higher. Just dodge it makes him insane. He has 30 physical resistance. This gets him to 45. And then sabotage and unrest is massive. Basically, if you start in uh, sieging a defender, they take more casualties than they would. Previously in Total Warhammer, it was the only lord that once you start besieging a settlement would take attrition immediately. It's been nerfed a bit, but you ruin their control and you lower their leadership as well. But that's when the enemy is sieging you. Um, just be aware of that, but it does allow you to be a bit more defensive. Up top, Sneaky, Trixie, all worth putting on him. Rat Fu weakens the enemy heroes as well. Expert Thief is kind of neglectable. All told, you're going to want to do Blue Line. And you might want to do red line, although the red line bonus infiltrator isn't amazing, but definitely do yellow line and definitely do his personal yellow line. Um, he's amazing at assassinating those dragons. They die really quickly when they get jumped on by a rat with three blades. In case you're wondering how he does that, he holds one in his tail, as you can just see. Um, and he also has a spike on the back of his head, which is also crazy as well. Now, he's got two quests, both of which are worth taking. Weeping Blades, you'll get a mission rather than a quest battle. Um, this is really powerful, buffs your elite Eshin units, as well as gives them more weapons and piercing damage. The Whirl of Weeping Blades is absolutely nuts. Goes for five seconds, does hundreds of damage. You can't move while using it, but if you're in the middle of an enemy army or a lord is fighting you, you activate this, you do a lot of damage very quickly. Further on, Cloak of Shadows, again, more ambush. These are the assassins right up there with um, Clan Rictus. These guys are going to be ambushing anything that moves. Again, melee defense is nice. Cloak of Shadows weakens enemies' leadership and defense, making him even better at assassinating. He also becomes, all told, you take all these really hard for enemy heroes to act on you, which is really nice. Um, all told, I love Deathmaster Snitch. His other units, though, are painful to use. Now, we can correct that by using the last part of the Shadowy Dealings, the Clan Contracts. So you will get Clan Contracts every time this shows up. The problem is actually fulfilling them. Um, you're going to want to have a Lord or Heroes Master Assassin ones so that it becomes easier to deal with the Shadowy Dealings. Because if you send Snitch on one of these, he leaves the map, um, which means he's not available for some time, which considering he's really strong, hurts you, especially at the beginning. If you have a Master Assassin Lord, you can send them off instead. 
which makes it a lot easier. They disappear, but they come back. And uh, any of your assassin type ones are good at that. The Eshin actions outside of Di Death Nor uh, Night Lords say so allow snitch or the others to stay on it you also don't have to do this with snitch you can do it with any of your other lords meaning you can level up lords really quickly um you're gonna have a lot of level 20 lords and heroes let me just tell you but the clan contracts come with a different benefit first off they tend to give a good chunk of money they also boost your relations to different factions so you'll start at zero um if we hover up here they're indifferent now, as you act against them, you will receive penalties towards them, relations, food if you're going after Clan Pestilence, making them one of the ones you should go after the least, reduce research, increase construction. This one's actually the one I target the most because 4% construction cost isn't terrible. This one, on the other hand, control can be painful. These are negatives. If you go positive, and you'll see it all the way up here, recruitment costs negative 220%. So your Eshin units, they are hard to recruit. Once they're recruited, though, their upkeep is the same. If you become good relations with these people, as you can see, there are various different bonuses. Clan Molder, the physical resistance makes Snitch even more crazy. Um, getting these bonuses allows you to upkeep the, sorry, to recruit those units. Basically, not for free, but back to their normal cost. Now, because each one of these is given by one clan versus the other clans, you're always going to be ruining reputation with somebody. If you just keep accepting all of them, eventually you'll gain relations with all of them to a decent level. But early on, it might be worth focusing on one or two of them. I recommend Clan Pestilins and probably Clan Moors early on. Target uh, Clan Scryer and Clan Molder, mainly because of the units you're going to get. If you want a frontline storm vermin or clan rats, you want to be good friends with clan moors. If you want food, um, getting um, clan pestilence happy, or at least not making them unhappy, uh, will help you with your food problems. Also be aware it will establish diplomatic relations with them at some point, uh, meaning if you see them get low health, you can confederate them. Snitch is probably the best at confederating the other uh, skaven around the map. And since his lords never defect, makes it a lot easier to deal with them. All told, you want to take a clan contract. You really don't want to use Snitch for them. You want to use a uh, Master Assassin. His victory conditions, he has to perform eight Eshin actions, which is a joke. You're going to do it within the first 20 turns. You have to take out these guys here, take the wall, as well as take out the Dragon Lady, all of which are reasonably easy to lose. One of the biggest problems you might have is the Dark Elves to the east, though, because they are the, um, they're the Corsairs, Loki, or Felhart. Their Corsairs are better in melee combat than you are, and range-wise, they're also stronger early on. Um, that's where the ability of Snitch to make his units from the shadows uh, makes a world of difference while fighting them. On the other hand, you might be able to get a non-aggression pack with them if you do. I wouldn't focus on the Celestial Loyalist. I'd focus on wiping out the Dragon Lady as fast as you can before she gets strong. The Celestial Loyalists never get too powerful. And after that, once you control the whole area, you can expand the way you want to. Sadly, despite the description of you needing to complete these Death, death Night Lords say so, they need to change this text, which they just copied straight, to complete the campaign. They need to alter him. I suspect a rework is in order, or at least buffs. Hopefully they give him a melee unit that can actually fight that's in Clan Eshin in melee combat. Um, he's fun to play, though. The fact you can level him up and he can basically 1v1 lords and heroes or multiple at the same time is really fun. So get Kulan first. Wipe out these green skins. Turtle up a bit. Figure out where you're going to expand. Try to get access to some of the elite machinery. Even though it is expensive to build, um, the elite Skaven artillery units are still worth having. On to the last lord. Okay, here we are as the last Skaven lord brought the unclean, the Clan Mulder. These guys are located right on the border of Cathay, right on the border of the Chaos Waste. Thankfully, you can actually get along pretty well with the Chaos factions. 
definitely try and get non-aggression packs and even alliances with them. Focus on killing off Norska. Uh, not Norska, sorry. Focus on using Norska to kill off Kislev. Um, since most Norska factions raise land, you can also just expand by occupying in their wake. You start with Hell Pit, which is a very powerful settlement. It's a large one. It's worth early on either starting to get the food income, but honestly, what you want to do is grow it as fast as you can so that you gain access to both the arcane generators, but more important, the garrison. Uh, despite this being a large settlement, it's not amazingly defensive. You're going to want a garrison in it as soon as possible. You might be a one province uh, faction for quite some time, which is okay, because the longer the game goes on, the better the Skaven become. Now, I'm going to be entirely honest. This is the last Skaven Lord to have been created. I fi personally find most of their mechanics rather disturbing, so I have not played them that much. I don't know why, but they, some of their insane bio tinkering is just disturbing. Also, their propensity to want to eat everything. So they have access to the Flesh Laboratory, where they can basically construct and alter and mutate creatures left and right. They're immune to mountain attrition, which is nice. None of these passes cause trouble. They, all their characters have more hit points. Doesn't apply to their units, but their heroes and lords. And constructing the various monster units and laboratory units are cheaper and easier. So what does that mean? It means you're going to be building a lot of these type units, which is fine because you get buffs to them. So let's look at Throt, and then we'll go into the Flesh Laboratory. Ugh. So this guy, first off, is kind of massively mutated himself. Um, that's his whole thing. He's the Lord of the Hell Pit. All the monstrous units he has are cheaper to upkeep. He has regeneration. He also has the ability Beast Pack, as well as Master Controller. And all his monster units have more armor. Beast Pack allows you to summon Rat Ogres, which is kind of control cool. Uh, rat Ogres being pretty powerful. Summon this behind the enemy front line or on the side and get a nice flank. Master Controller, this continuously gives leadership and melee defense to all the people in area, meaning he can sit behind the line or near his monsters and buff them even more. Um, also makes your default units that much tankier. Now he's got a standard blue line. You're going to want to do probably Ancient Cunning, since you're going to be fighting a lot early on, as well as probably Bonded Service, Draft Master, Quarter Master, um, Mine all mine is really nice since you won't expand much. Getting increased money is nice. Renowned and feared is good. Red line, you're going to want inspiring presence early on on almost all the Skaven because it helps with their leadership problems. But you're going to want to grab Molder Knowledge. Uh, it's not a huge boost, but it is nice. The big benefit comes when you get mutagenic elixirs, physical resistance, leadership, and armor. You could honestly skip Molder Knowledge and instead get Pack Leader or even something like Last Master instead. Standard die is great. Now, Throt is not nearly as strong in combat as Snitch, Queek, or Tretch. Um, he's still decent in combat. You definitely can turn him into a powerful lord. His stats are decent. He gets stronger. The fact he has regen is rather nice. Uh, he's more of a tank than a killer. Now, his other abilities here. He has Remoldered, which he can use on an ally. That's a monster unit, gives them a huge melee attack as well as a heal and leadership. He's all about monsters. So he's going to have a lot of pack masters. So growth juice from recycled units up, combat stats on him as well. Specimens, collector, more gross growth juice, or rather gross juice. Um, income as well as casualty punishment, all good. Ravaging hunger, perfect vigor is always a handy thing on a lord. Leadership is nice as well. Master of the Mutated, huge buffs to all your monstrous units. And the Great Unclean One, he gets a ward save, as well as the ability to summon another Rat Ogre unit with some hit points. Warp Stone Weapon, Magic Attacks, and other damage. The big thing he gets here is he can be put on a Brood Horror. Um, this makes him significantly better at combat. Still doesn't make him as strong as the other Skaven Lords, but he's quite capable of fighting. He is not a spellcaster, though, meaning he is a melee fighter. And since he does buff everybody around him when fighting, it can be worth using. His quests, he gains Creature Killer from this Creature Killer weapon. Uh, helps him kill large units. 
pretty good against other monstrous ones. Um, you're not going to see tons of monsters early on, but if you end up fighting the Kislevite bears, right, handy, as well as in making him tankier and better in general at fighting people. This one you can use to buff your allies at killing monsters, which is nice as well. Whip of Domination, more leadership for your monstrous units. They basically stop routing at the as soon as they take damage. Further movement, again, melee attack. And for some reason, your Skaven Slaves get a charge bonus, meaning the weakest units you'll have become a little bit better. Okay, that was the pleasant part. On to the less pleasant stuff. It's, it's honestly a bit disturbing. So they have this growth bat, which as it builds up, they gain access to units that they can then recruit instantly to their army. And you're going to be doing that a lot. Uh, it allows you to get better units than you can access through the buildings. You have you gain mutagens from your growth bat and converting units. Um, you can only store 100. You use it to research things in the flesh lab. So the flesh lab is all about weird bio tinkering and engineering. So you've got three different categories. The laboratory here, you can spend money and resources to get different effects. Recruit people with augments, gain recruit ranks, gain juice from battles. These unlock. It's worth snagging them when you can. Um, steroid infusions is amazingly powerful. Mutagen buyback will give you mutagens. Unclean energy bars is a huge casualty replenishment rate, um, as well as leadership and the summoning of more uh, rat ogres. Harvest organs, huge replenishment for monsters. Now, you've got two different trees, infantry and monsters. Both of them have a variety of different stuff. So we'll do infantry first. First off, if you take a unit, you can then click on and buy an augment here for a certain amount of mutagen. In order to unlock higher ones, you have to buy the low ones. As you unlock more mutagens, things become less stable. In fact, if you do it all the way, um, they can sometimes gain instability where they can't replenishment and will die in battle. There's a nice little description here. I recommend you read it. I'm not going to do as good job as they did. But suffice to say, if we pick this, there's a 10% chance they'll become unstable. We apply this. Now they're level one. They have stock and vanguard attributes. We do this, spell armor, spell resistance and armor. Now you'll see this is unstable. Um, we can augment it further or they can be recycled for growth juices, which is disgusting. Uh, but you can enhance it further, and I recommend doing this to your Skaven slaves early on, basically spending most of your mutagens on them. They're pretty well a trash unit, but as you can see, all of a sudden, this unit here, which was a joke, is now on par as your clan rats, but it is unstable. What does that mean? Well, once it gets into doing anything, so long as it has hit points, it starts taking damage to itself. Um, it makes it unstable. On the other hand, you can get some pretty crazy bonuses. Uh, Frenzy is always good. Armor's good. Recruitment rank is rather nice as well. I mean, this is now a level five Skaven Slave. If you imagine doing it on Storm Vermin, powerful. There's various ones you want to grab. Be aware that these uncommon mutagens only apply to your unlocked ones. These ones I've already paid for. Um, you can keep building it up. Replenishment rate and upkeep is really nice if you stick it on all your units. 15% cheaper armies that regen. Very powerful. Further up, you get stuff like insane combat. But the downside here is it will never heal. But if you stick it on something like a Skaven Slave, it becomes stronger. The downside is they still have terrible weapon strength. Uh, fear and terror is can be useful as well. Be aware that your Skaven have leadership issues. This makes them worse. Uh, physical resistance, though, you stick this on Skaven Slaves or even um, Storm Vermin, makes them significantly better at tanking the enemy. Um, second Brain, um, they gain access to this Death Fury where they can buff themselves as well as encourage allies. Um, it's really nice. But I particularly like Necro Parasites, which, by the way, takes a while to get to. I mean, you have to buy a lot to get up there. Once you do, though, you can add it to people it has a chance of healing um, when you activate it, and it will resurrect your unit similar to the vampires. This one gives regeneration to all your units. Stick this on their storm vermin. They become monsters. If you don't want to specifically engineer it, you just want to go crazy for a cheaper cost. Final evolution, 
will randomly apply augments. Um, some of these are rather useful. Some of them are less than useful. I tend to do it, um, target which ones I want on units myself rather than letting the randomness of the AI pick. Similar things for the monsters. They gain bonuses as well. Obviously, we can't go too far into this in terms of buying, but some important ones to note, physical resistance and speed is good. Um, Guardian, this will buff your lords and heroes. Can be very nice to put on uh, single entity units like a rat and meat ogre. Casualty replenishment and upkeep. These things can be expensive. Cheaper is always good. Contaminating attacks is pretty interesting because it lowers, I believe, leadership. Um, cellular instability here. If for some reason you've got a unit and you, you're not going to do much with it, this allows you to throw it into the combat and have it explode. The casualty replenishment rate is low, sadly. Um, if you want stock and unspottable, great. The downside is you really don't have any units that become super powerful that on. Acidic musk lands is really nice, though. Um, you can activate it. Be aware that it affects all the allies in an area. It lowers armor and does damage. This is to be used on units that are going to fight on their own rather than around allies. This one, random mutagens. I like bloodworm, though. It gives makes them undead, so now they don't rout. Instead, they crumble. You can, of course, only put this on monstrous units, but the fact that you can get regen on some units that don't start with regen can be pretty powerful. Um, let's see. How do I do this? Ah, if we click on this, I haven't done this that much as these guys. These guys are unstable. You click on them, they can be recycled for growth juice. So if we do that, you'll see this bar builds up. Once it hits different levels, you unlock it. Once you are able to do this, you can empty the growth bat and claim all of these. You'll also gain mutagen as well. It's rather disgusting, um, but they are disgusting faction escaping. Now, your pack masters, you're going to want to use a lot. And it's worth mentioning because they will heal and buff your monstrous units. So you're going to want a lot of them in your various armies. Um, not only that, but they can summon units as well, which can be quite handy to cause havoc among the enemy. Shot cost collar is really good at buffing your monstrous units as well. Uh, all told, you're going to be playing rather defensive. You're going to want to be trying to basically raise Skaven slaves and probably um, these wolf rats, giving them the augments, slowly building that up to unlock new powerful units. Be aware, most of your bonuses towards your growth bats you're going to get from fighting, meaning fighting is very important for you. If we combine these and fight this battle, we'll win, obviously. Da -da -da. Um, we gain growth juice from it, even if it doesn't tell us. Um, when you take settlements, obviously, well, we can't do it here. Um, you can also get stuff from that battle as well. Obviously, when that battle retreats to your lands, recruit units, you're not going to be able to expand too much early on. The big goal here is if you can take Prague, that would be amazing. Otherwise, you're probably going to go war with Kostaltan over here in Erengrad. Eventually, uh, the Tsarina will come after you as well. You're probably going to need to wait till the Warriors of Chaos come to help you. You can win without them, but it's easier. You definitely want to be friends with all the major warriors, like the guy who appears here. Um, keep them on your good side. You'll be in good shape. Thankfully, they don't dislike you. I wouldn't recommend going after the dwarves first, uh, mainly because the Norse could go there as well. You can if you want. It's not the world's most amazing thing. None of these provide you any bonus. Really, focusing in the hell pit is key. You do have a unique building, giving you food, control, as well as helping recruit more of your high-level monstrous units. All told, though, get the garrison in here. You really have no margin for error as this faction. If someone takes help hit, you're pretty much dead. Enjoy playing as a rather gross guy, and uh, that will be it for the guide. So thank you guys all for watching. It's This is going to be like a two-hour, 40-minute or so guide. Um, it's kind of crazy to think I've talked that much in the last day or two. And uh, hopefully it's helped you. If it has, do leave a like, comment, subscribe, ring the bell. I do have a Discord as well as memberships, so you can join those. And uh, I hope it helped you.
I really hope it did. Uh, Skaven are quite fun. There's nothing like wrecking enemies with rattling guns. And I hope to see you in another guide, Let's Play, or others. And bye for now.